Is this thing on? Are you ready, Matt? You're listening to Box Office Binges with Matt Diaz and Ernesto Santos. Good evening, folks. We have a wonderful evening's entertainment lined up for you. We know each other. He's a friend from work. Box Office Binges. Hello and welcome to another episode of Box Office Bingers. And Ernesto, if there is no love in Oklahoma, there is surely a lot of love here on this podcast for for more reasons than one. Uh, First being that we're just going to put it right in the front, right in front of this episode. We have done this before. We have. This conversation has happened. And now this is our redemption episode uh, because Ernesto, tell tell our lovely listeners what happened, who do we have here again, and what movie we are reviewing today. It's a lot to ask at this moment. Well, but. unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties, and by the grace of beautiful friendship, and uh, I don't know, just <laughs> your good nature, Kellyanne. Thank you so much for. Like, not only coming on the first time and giving us your time, but coming on a second time. So now, like, we've got you to go to the movies. Spend that time, go to the movies. Come and talk to us and come and let us do it again for you. Uh, so we apologize. You know, we're so sorry for the bottom of our hearts. But we, uh, we're we so grateful for you to come back on and have this conversation again. Like, I just can't wait to hear your weather science and you nerd out all over again. You know, I'm really sorry, actually, because I should have known that I could go. This was like my opportunity to go see it in 40X Uh. and compare it. (laughs) This was my perfect opportunity. And it just hit me now that that's what I should have done. And so I apologize to you guys. Oh, no, you have nothing. Uh, That that is 100 percent not necessary. Not one one bit. what 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 a busy weather weekend it was even after the fact. And leading in, yeah. leading uh, back us to meeting up again on this fine afternoon. Yeah, it's well, thanks for new. being so patient. Oh. Oh. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> patient. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Needless right. to say, this has been an interesting week. Not only have uh, that we are now having this conversation again, which you know it's funny when because now we know exactly what we feel about certain parts of the movie, and now we're here trying to replicate this conversation. And I said right before we start recording, we're not going to try to recreate the conversation that we had, and and it was a great conversation, and I will always have that as a memory, not as a recording, but as a memory. Yeah. But instead, uh, I would like to match the same energy that we got. From that conversation, bring it back over here. The fact that, Kellyanne, you decided to come back to probably spend another hour and a half to two hours of your time to just rehash this conversation, it's its so, so humbling. So uh, it's its its very much appreciated that you are coming back on. Uh, but the movie in question, Ernesto, tell the people what we're reviewing this week again. So the we are reviewing Twisters by Daisy Edgar, jo- Daisy Edgar Jones, Glenn Powell, Anthony Ramos. Directed by Lee Isaac Chung, who also directed Minari. Written by Mark L. Smith, who wrote The Revenant, Midnight Sky, The March King's, um, the March King's Daughter, and The Boys in the Boat. Story by Joseph Kaczynski. The director by Top Gun Maverick, which ironically was, was the last episode that Kellyanne, Kellyanne was on. So seems like mm-hmm. she's got a thing for Joseph Kaczynski's uh, storytelling. Um, or Glenn Powell. Or Glenn, it's probably mainly, it's probably Glenn Powell <laughs> more than anything. But hey, we, we, see that, we, we see who they like to work with. And yeah. <laughs> uh, also uh, Tron Legacy, Oblivion, and Only the Brave. Uh, Kellyanne, once again, as our local meteorologist, thank you so much for coming back on to talk about this movie. Uh, first, let's catch up with you. Like, what's going on in your weather world or anything, any big news in your uh, personal life? Well, since the last time I've been on here, um, there has been a lot of personal stuff going on. Um, I got engaged last year in June. Um, to my fiance, Joel. Thank you. Um, and we are getting married in less than a month. So uh, full prep, full wedding prep mode. <laughs> which which is even crazier that you decided to come back on again 
because we said this exact same thing last time. We were like, wow, you're about less than a month and you're coming on this podcast. We were so thankful for that. And then now a week later, it's like, wow, now it's even a shorter time frame. And you still said yes, which is insane to me. It's like you could have easily well, been like, you know mean, what? I got things to plan. I mean, what are we guys talking about? We had this conversation already. Yeah, but like one, I love tornadoes, but two, like you guys are great. So oh, obviously you. I'm going to try to do my best oh. to be here and help you guys out, talk about nerd out i should say um we're nerding out and i feel like i'm gonna emulate that again so i wouldn't be worried it's gonna be the same energy <laughs> right, no i'm still gonna bring it and i have a cat <laughs> tim, um did again. not have a cat last time um but tim my sleeping child right now um he may be featured you know like once or twice in this conversation sometimes he'll just poke his head up and meow and i'll <laughs> You know, wag his tail as soon as you say refer that. to him. Yeah. yeah, he's he's acknowledging that you're talking about him by wagging his tail. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's it's great because I also have a cat. And then for those who are following us on social media, and if you're not, you should be, uh, that we're going to have a photo of all of us having a great time from the first time. But we also have our cats featured in this photo. So they are the... Uh, they are the companions to these podcast episodes. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad to see that uh, as for visual entertainment, we're going to see either the cat sleeping, walking, meowing, scratching. You know, we, we who knows what what, what little Tim's going to do in the, in the course of this episode. You never know. And you know what? He always keeps me on my toes and he's a very chatty Kathy. So <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if uh, <laughs> Mr. Timmy here talks a lot. Timmy uh, talks I mean, a lot. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> that works. Uh, Not right now, though. <laughs> yeah. No, no. He's he's sleeping. He's got he's got more yeah. important things to do. But when yeah, he yeah. when we get to like the nitty gritty of this conversation, he's gonna let us know what he's thinking right now. Oh, for sure. Um, and then as, as far as like your meteorology world, uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned last time you were doing anything specific. I, I think you were talking about, I forgot what it was, but you were talking about something that you were either striving for to kind of further your education uh, into meteorology. Oh, yeah. Um, as far as the professional career, um, I am working on getting my certified broadcast meteorologist seal. Um, uh, and so we were talking last time about, well, how is that different from a degree? And so basically for those that don't know, there are meteorologists on television who are, who do not have their degree in meteorology. They may have a degree in like journalism and then a certificate. Um, and it may be hard to distinguish like who is, you know, a meteorologist that got their degree or like someone that got their certificate. So the American Meteorological Society has this certification essentially. Um, and when you pass a written test and um, an exam of your performance, uh, they either issue you your CBM seal is what they call it, or they don't. And basically that's just saying like, hey, this person has all the qualifications to be a meteorologist. They know how to talk to the viewer in a um, manner where it's easy to understand and they still know, you know, like what they're talking about. So, um, I'm not too concerned about it. I really have just been putting it off for the past, like, five years. Um, and so I figured, you know, after after a wedding, if I can play in a whole wedding in a year, um, I can do anything. So <laughs> I'm going to finally s start studying <laughs> um, and hopefully to get my CBM seal. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, you, uh, Wedding planning really puts into perspective how much time you actually have afterwards it's like wow i was so busy and now i need something to fill that void again <laughs> i literally think that's what's going to happen i will say i am so excited to get my afternoons back mm -hmm. um i am not excited for not having a wedding <laughs> like i've been looking forward to this for like a whole year and then it'll be over what i have to look forward to next i think i'm feel maybe there you go. Sounds well, hopefully great. you can still cherish those moments when it happens. Like, I know the planning is stressful, but once we get there, I don't know personally, but Ernesto should know that it should be worth it by the end of it. Oh, it is. Like, it, there's so much stress. I mean, there. my my wedding day was unfortunate. There, this, what a horrible thing. Like, I mean, it was a beautiful day. Obviously, that's not what I mean. What I mean is, like, there were just so many issues that it was like, it was supposed to, a day that's supposed to be so perfect and beautiful was just riddled with so many like little problems. And then at the end, like, that's really what it's about. It's like, 
how we overcome and how we still manage to get together. Like literally we walked into the hall the morning of to do the final walk and I go, Hey, uh, where's our dance floor? They go, Oh, you don't get one. And we don't, we're not going to be able to get you one. And I was like, well, that's going to be a problem because we're supposed to have a dance floor at this wedding as stated in our contract. And through back and forth, we had one. Needless to say, by the time, when the time came, there was a dance floor there. But it was like little stuff like that. And then, you know, all, you know, how it is when all families get together. But it was a, oh yeah. It, but it all became worth it when I saw my wife walk down the aisle. That's like, that, it, just, it like broke me. But that's a, did you cry? I, of course. Absolutely. Like, this oh, is... okay. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> good answer. <laughs> Hannah, he did cry. He did cry, Hannah. Well, she knows. She was I watching me. I tell my me. fiance all the time, like, if Mitch doesn't cry when I walk down the aisle, I can't marry him. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. What if he's silent? What, I will. what if he cries emotionally? What if he's, like, you're so emotionally moved? What if he's welled up, but they, he's just so strong? I mean, he is a man of the military. He just holds him in his eyes. <laughs> Well, I mean, I could see when, you know, he tears up and like when he has, you know, like water in his eyes. But if there's nothing and it's just stone cold, <laughs> nothing behind those eyes, red flag. Like, we got, we're going to have conversations. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so that moment. <laughs> no pressure, Mitch. No pressure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, thanks, guys. Oh, man. Well, it sounds like you got a lot going on. Uh, needless to say, um, and it's it's because of that. Again, just putting it out there. Thank you again for for coming back on to have this conversation, and uh, and we're gonna be just rolling through that into that conversation uh, right now. But before we do that, I just want to make a quick mention that for those have been who have been listening and keeping up with our House of the Dragon uh, like weekly reviews, uh, we're gonna be attaching that at the back end of this episode. So we're gonna be going over episode seven. And eight. We recorded episode seven originally, but that got away. So now we're just be doing seven again, as well as the finale for eight and what's to come as we wait two years for season three, probably, and all that stuff that's going on. Kellyanne, have you watched House of Dragon? Are you a Game of Thrones person? No, I watched one episode of Game of Thrones, and it's just not really for me. I am more of a reality television person. Totally yeah. Um, my fiance has. I don't know if he's watched House of... I feel like he's watched House of Dragons. I know so many people that have, and I just... I can't get into it. But The Crown on Netflix, like, <laughs> it's weird, because, like, I kind of like those, like, back in the day, what would it be like, mm -hmm. you know, like, medieval... I don't know. I, I find it so interesting, but also, I, I just... I'm not one for like gory fights. Like I want sunshine and rainbows. Okay. <laughs> we, we, you see enough doom and gloom every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have yeah. enough in my life at work with all the news that we do that um, when I come home, I just like want mindless television. Yep. That's fair. Totally understand. That's fair. Well, with that, well, let's dive into our spoiler review of Twisters and Kellyanne as our local meteorologist here. Uh, let's start with you, your thoughts on the film. Um, okay, overall thoughts. I thought it was good. I don't think that it compares to the original movie. Um, nothing will compare to the original movie. But I did like how it had some hints to the original movie. And it's so funny because watching the movie, the entire time I was just like, okay, that's real. That's pushing the like the border of it. And Okay, that's not real. That doesn't actually happen. So I feel like I was kind of like in work mode where – this must be like for the, for, you know, like all the firefighters, EMT and police that watch like <laughs> Chicago PD fire, you know, Chicago EMS, whatever. Um, I I'm sure they're probably like, no, that doesn't really happen in real life. Or this is like, you know, like nothing like what the, the show portrays. And I feel like that in a sense with this movie, um, with the opening, like they just wake up and there's severe weather or there's like about to be severe weather in Oklahoma. Well, in severe weather season, in the plains in Oklahoma, it's usually in the afternoon and evening instead of in the morning. Can't say it doesn't, you know, it, it can change, but um, yeah, 
I it just went on a tangent. Anyway, Ke- yeah, Kellyanne was like, first red flag. This is an afternoon situation, <laughs> not a morning situation. Already off to a bad start. I don't like it. Uh, <laughs> there are just so many analytical things. And like, that's me. I'm just such an analytical person mm-hmm. that I, the entire time I was like, okay, like I know these, these are actors and actresses portraying meteorologist and you know this isn't real or this is real so i think that like it was just hard for me to put that to bed but i mean overall like it had a good storyline it had a little bit of like on your seat moments and um for the first time i was actually able to predict what would happen in a movie i feel like there are Mm. people my fiance included who like just know what's going to happen like Mm. next in a movie or like in a tv show Like, it's just so easily readable. And for me, I think it's just because of my background. Like, that was, that was me. So that that was just kind of funny. So good to be, to be that person in that movie. Like, I already know what's going to happen. It's like, oh, look look at this. Yeah. Look at that weather. Oh, I know. I know what that weather means. (laughs) I also, though, did not like it because I'm like, well, now what? Like, I already knew this was going to happen. So now what? What do I do now? Uh, do, do you feel like it was specifically for this movie, but do you feel like that when you do watch a movie or a show and like you have a hard time, like, like, well, that can't really happen is like, do you often run into those moments when you watch, like, say, like an action movie with big explosions and all this stuff is like, well, that's that's just not practical. Um, or is it just specifically with this movie since you have a very large weather background? It is literally this movie. I cannot tell you how many movies that I've watched where I'm like, I have no idea what's going to happen next. (laughs) And then like, Oh, could this, like, I literally think like this could be real life, like (laughs) in like an action movie or um, like a chick flick. Mm -hmm. Like to me, I'm like, Oh yeah, this happened in real life. This could totally happen. Well, that makes sense. I mean, it's just like a human story. Like it's very easy. It's very plausible that, you know, that those situations could happen is, but it's different when something like this, that's, you know, when there are certain things that are based in fact, it's like, well, that literally will, will never happen. <laughs> yeah, like that literally cannot happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and later on this episode, we are going to be going over a few fact versus fission. We're f- fishing. fishing. No. Fishing. Fact, we're f- you know what? We're fishing for, for some facts. That's what we're going to be doing. <laughs> <Fishing> <laughs> there we go. Fishing for facts. There you go. What, I what saved you. Back. Back. Yes. Saved me. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and we're going to be we're going to be nerding out a little bit on getting down to these conversations of if these certain particular situations that happen in this movie can actually happen in real life, like fire tornadoes. Is that a thing? We'll find it later on. But Ernesto, what were your thoughts on the movie? Um, I, I actually really enjoyed it. I think narrative, see, science aside, I think narratively compared to the first one, I think it's a little bit better. What I appreciate about the first one is the the necessity the the more necessity they had to use practical effects and make it look realistic mm-hmm. so there there was more physical effort that took into it not that there wasn't in this one but we they had technology on their side even though they did use practical effects in this one as well but the other one is is more like there's just as far as like a cinematic achievement it's just like you can't appreciate it for you have to appreciate it for what it is um I thought the way the, they made the villain was really interesting because he wasn't evil necessarily, just more opportunistic, um, you know. And uh, Anthony Ramos's character Javi, he uh, like he capitalized on that because he feels like he's trying to do a greater good. And then you know, narratively, they kind of he comes to terms with realizing that it's not about that. And I thought that was I, I thought that was good. Like th- instead of this like cartoonish evil like. Uh, money tycoon that just buys land and well, that's destroyed which essentially what it was but i don't know i just the way they set it up was fine um i like the opening scene it was really intense but then it did kind of it did kind of happen out of nowhere like these kids just got decimated like they're just running <laughs> to that underpass and that one girl just gets carried away by debris and then her boyfriend at the top of the overpass where he just gets sucked away but yet she she managed to survive like like, I don't know. Maybe you, because you were closer, you have a chance, but, and a little bit of wind got in between you. Um, what else? Uh, the, uh, Glenn Powell's performance was absolutely amazing. Daisy Edgar Jones, I thought she did a really good, really good. But for me, um, it didn't seem like the movie didn't start until Glenn Powell kind of showed up on screen. Like we, like I appreciated yeah, I the, I appreciated the soft setup, but if we had brought Glenn Powell in like 15 minutes earlier, and giving us more of him, like nobody would have been mad. 
<laughs> but he did come in in a I, crazy isn't the right word, but like, and I don't want to say hot as in like attractive, but like he he came in hot where it's like there's this music yeah. blare and this big yeah. old truck and it's just like okay like the main person is here like the main guy yeah like a lot of energy like he's just like he brought that he's like movie started now guys let's go like yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah a lot of charisma a lot of energy it's just uh, like yeah to your point like he like I mean essentially if you think about it from before that moment the movie was kind of a little bit on the downside like. We just had a, a few people just die, mm-hmm. and then we have this the our main character, um, uh, Kate, who is trying to like I don't want to do this anymore. We got Javi over here being like, yeah, we should come over for the week and chase some storms. We do some good over here, and then then we see her like you know playing with flowers, trying to test the winds or whatever, and then all of a sudden. Tyler comes on board, coming in with his big old truck, and he's got this YouTube channel. You're like, oh, wait, hold up, wait a minute, what is this? What's going on over here? Um, yeah, no, for sure. He definitely brought in a lot of energy. But even before. But even so, like when he comes in like that, you he comes in as like this big personality who's like almost annoying, but throughout the course of the story, we kind of break yep. down his character and really who he is as a person. And I just thought that the way they did it kind of just flowed with the narrative. It didn't feel force or really out of place um i mean in any exposition or monologue like he was really was really good that rodeo scene before um before the Mm -hmm. you know the instant tornado comes um i thought it was really good and actually in reading an interview that the reason they did the scene that way because that was based on a previous some previous experience that he had when he was a kid where they had noticed but it was being at a rodeo and like watching every and having that tornado warning and then having to rush home mm. and him having to be faced that once again, like being faced with nature of like, oh shit, like, what are we going to do? Like, <laughs> like, how do you survive? Like, what do we do about this? <laughs> Where is he from? Uh, Texas, I believe. Let me look. Let's take oh, that. okay. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> that checks out. That checks out. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. that makes sense. That, that checks out. Yeah. Rodeo, tornado, makes sense. Um, yeah. <laughs> also, let's. I, I want to talk about the promotion we talked about a little bit last time. Is um, that the Noah website did this kind of cross promotional with the movie, and on their website they've got uh, um, like little short form videos and just kind of just storm awareness and they how they brought the cast on and just showing that they took the effort. And granted, there are a lot of things that are not real, but. At least they seem like they try to make it some sort of an effort to make it realistic. Because I know you mentioned something about uh, there was the maps that they showed in one of the earlier scenes, and you're like, "That's not. That's like not the thing you're supposed to be looking at." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they showed just like a bunch of like random radar stuff, and it was like, "Oh, it's tracking to the east," and it's like not even show. It's like just showing these gray pixels, and I'm like, "What am I looking at? This is not the storm, and it's not even in motion." Like you need to put it into motion to figure out where it's going. Um, and then it's just so funny with the scene. So when Kate um, gives up storm chasing, she goes into the National Weather Service as a forecaster there. And I guess there's a severe storm rolling through the New York uh, office. And there's this guy that like talks to his boss, which is essentially the meteorologist in charge at the National Weather Service. And that person goes, I don't know, Kate, what do you think? Well, that's not... That's not how it works. You know? <laughs> and then they were just saying, well, you know, the, the, the winds are at, I forget what the exact, exact number is, but it was below severe weather criteria. So you shouldn't be issuing a warning, but that's just the technical side of it. I, I can see you just watching that now. I know we had the, we were talking about this as well. Of like when we when Kate did end up going working for the National Weather Service, we, we had a, a we were talking about it and how much you were like, kind of comparing what actually happens at a national weather service and i can only imagine that like hey i know we have all this data that we can go off of and make these predictions on on, and scientifically but kate what what, what do you feel (laughs) we should do right now um do you think we should issue a warning and she goes no no we should be fine all right screw the data we're good kate Kate yeah, says Kate we're fine. Kate fine. knows she would never say yeah, wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never. So now I'm curious because Kate left for a week and presumably forever. So now what what are they going to do without Kate in the office? This this is this is probably really bad for them. Like because then they're never going to get anything right and they're they're not going to trust the data anymore. Are they? Is Kate like now a contractor? 
Like, we need to know the facts here because we need another I'm, movie just about that. Yeah, we. I'm really concerned about the National Weather Service in, in the in the confines of this film. Um, but anyway, Ernesto, back to, to Noah. No, I no, you're fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just thought it was cool. I mean, it, it, there's like just a, a small form article that just talks about the different things in the movie and different and different storms. And they've got like six videos um, that talks about overpass and twisters. The other ones is about tornado warnings. Um, is taming tornado a thing? Short answer, no. <laughs> um, could a fire tornado happen? Yes, but maybe not exactly how it happened in that, that big scene that happens in the trailer. Um, this one's just about storm chasers. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what phased NSLL has been the driver of weather radar research and advancement for more than 50 years. So I guess it just talks about phased array and the future of radar. Is is that, is that, is that do those words mean anything to you, Kellyanne? <laughs> the NSSL is the National Severe Storms Lab. Mm -hmm. So um, they, I don't actually really know what they do, but I, I know, I know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Those words do make sense when you put them together. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, um, as you look I, at my forehead. I think she's reading it. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. We'll uh, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And it just talks about the next generation of weather radar, watches, you know, things to look for, just a way to bring people awareness and in, in storm awareness. So I just thought it was, well, I thought I, it was I, great. No, I think it's really cool that you know, and we were uh, this 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 movie is based off of s some reality mm -hmm. to it. I mean, yeah, that we took some liberties in certain scenes just to be dramatic or exciting for the audience to watch. But it's really cool that they were able to like take a, like there's a lot of truth into what they're to what this movie represents, and in a way that even though this is a, under a big scale, there's a lot of grounded reality to it that I'm glad that the the website what was it called again? Uh, that is noah.gov. Noah.gov. They were able to take the time, and the movie was able to work with them to kind of get a, you know, like, hey, you know, here's a learning lesson for those who enjoyed the movie and wanted to learn more about tornadoes and, and just weather in general. Yeah. So I think that is really cool that they were able to work on that. And um, for everyone who doesn't know what NOAA is, it's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They are the group, and then under that umbrella, you have the National Weather Service, the National Hurricane Center, the Storm Prediction Center, Weather Prediction Center. So it's like this big umbrella, and then you have like all of these other different things that fall under it. Oh, okay. Oh, well, there you go. The more you know. The more you know. Um, as um, far as my initial thoughts, that's that's what I got, Matt. What about you? That's you got. Okay. So I, um, <laughs> Kelly, you're already laughing. Well, you you already know, know what I'm about well, this stuff. Yeah, she already knows. <laughs> yeah. So I had the privilege to watch this movie in four years. I, 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 I feel like you're ready to listen to this conversation again. And you're already laughing. I am. <laughs> um, I had the opportunity to watch this movie in 40X. And mainly because Ernesto texted me and said, hey, are you watching this movie in 40X? Kellyanne wants to know. And I said, oh, you know, I really didn't give it that much thought. But sure, yeah, I can, I can watch this movie in 40X. If Kellyanne told me, not really, but she, if she's asking that if I'm – going to watch this movie in 40X, and therefore it could enhance the conversation twice now, then I, sure, I'll go watch this movie in 40X. And so I went on my phone. I was like, okay, let's pick uh, let's pick the showing on, on, a, on a Sunday. And um, I was like, wow, 12 packed, three packed, seven packed. Seven's too late. I'm an old man. I got to go earlier than that. <laughs> and so, but the, they had a 9 a.m. showing. And I was like, wow, there's like one seat left up in the top row in the corner. I guess that's mine because there's I'm not sitting in the front row because I could be just like in the movie swept away if I'm sitting in the front row. So we're not doing that. So in the back and I sit down, this place is packed. Now, mind you, this is 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning. And I'm just shocked that everyone's here. This is packed. Everyone's here to have a good time watching some twisters. And <laughs> this movie takes you on a whirlwind of, <laughs> of a ride. And, and I say that light. I don't say that lightly because you are legit moving around like there's no one's business and i've seen a few movies in 40x and ernesto knows i like to go watch the fast movies in 40x because they really they really give you a good time it really enhances enhances the experience um but this movie every time there was a storm you were part of the storm you were one with the storm you experienced the wind the rain the terror the horror everything you are one with it and the, the crazy part about this was that when the beginning of the movie started and we get that horrific 
cat uh what what they call it it was a what's the yeah, ef5 cat- thank you an ef5 tornado coming in and we have so much destruction our 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 uh, our characters go underneath the underpass some people get swept away and it all this bad stuff is happening and like we just see three people just die in the midst of the tornado and my seat the entire time is shaken up like this. Like we are one with it. I'm barely hanging on myself. And then the screen flashes to white and the most horrific thing happened to open this movie. And yet everybody in the theater is laughing their ass off because they just went through such, such an experience that I can tell that not a lot of people experience a 40 X movie and they felt the need to go watch this one because there's tornadoes and they want to maybe hear our locals in Orlando miss the twisters right over at universal. And they want to get that back by going to see the movie in 40 X. And the, the fact that everyone was laughing just makes me feel like not a lot of people go watch this movie. There are other factors that I know a lot of people don't typically watch this movie or watch movies in 40 X. Also just a tip. If you are watching a movie, in 40x be prepared to at any point of the movie be hungry because if you buy popcorn if you buy drinks and they don't have lids on those anything like if you get like a packet of m&ms wrap them up grab some paper clips i don't know yeah just like put them somewhere where when that chair starts moving it's not flying over because there's no there's no spot for you to to put these food like anything you got got nachos what are you doing eating nachos in a 40x screen it's not worth it man you're gonna have cheese all over yourself you got chips everywhere then you have to leave through the movie saying hey i just saw a 40x movie and now look at this i need to need more food or the same thing with the popcorn don't bring snacks into that movie don't bring drinks into the movie maybe a bottle of water cap it off something because otherwise you're putting all that stuff on the floor and that's gross so don't do that um, you have been personally victimized by a video movie i can, I can tell you you're it's a little bit too it's a little that too real like for you <laughs> matt um, who hurt the, you the, <laughs> yeah the, the chair the chair hurt me <laughs> when you're being tossed around when it's raining you get you're, you're getting sprints and i wouldn't say you get wet but you're like you're definitely getting like little sprinkles on you um and sometimes 40x they advertise you can smell things i'm like eh, not really um sometimes they said oh well there's when there's rubber burning the tires you uh you know you can smell the the burning rubber and i have yet to smell anything in a, in a 40x theater so maybe they can work out that but um but yeah, what, what I do, what you do get is that you do get an experience unlike anything else if you were just to to sit there and watch the movie. So to say that I got an enhanced experience, and I always feel like there are certain movies you go watch in 40X, and this one was definitely one of them. I know, Kellyanne, we were talking about this before we started recording the first time, and I said, hey, are you planning on watching this movie in 40X? And then you sent me a video of people experiencing it in 40X, and you were like, hell no! <laughs> because... <laughs> But now it feels like that maybe within my conversation, you might be a little bit lighter to maybe trying it out. So I have like this weird thing where like I go on roller coasters and I'm really anxious like the first time if I've never been on it. It's a big roller coaster because I don't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. And but like the second time I'm like, okay, let's do it again. I know what to expect and I know whether I like it or not. And I feel like that's this with this movie and 40X like. I didn't know what to expect with this movie. So I was like, I'm just going to watch it normally. But now I know (laughs) that I might get swept away in a tornado (laughs) if I watch it in 40X. That's right. But I'm going to take that chance. Good. So if they still have it available, I don't know if they do, but this this is now my opportunity because I know what's going to happen next. Exactly. So right. So right now, I so you said I think right before we started recording. No, no, at the beginning of the of the of the recording, you said that you wish you were to see it in 40X. I don't think it's in 40X just yet so i don't think you missed anything um but the like right now deadpool and wolverine is sweeping the box office and if you haven't listened to our episode on our review go listen to that episode 227 and uh so i but they're but they're bringing it back they said that by the end of the month so at the end of august i believe they're bringing back twister the original Mm -hmm. as well as Ah. twisters and I think you can b- watch both, not at the same time, but I think there's certain show times for each movie that you can watch that in 40X because it was due to popular demand. There are so many people who wanted to watch this movie in 40X and they only had a week to do it because once the week was over, Deadpool and Wolverine took it over and then those screens are now occupied. Um, the Twisters came out, Deadpool and Wolverine came in. So I think 
I don't know what type of maybe like the studio paid for a certain amount of weeks that the movie is going to be in there. But it sounds like by the end of August, they're putting Twisters back in 40X because really there's no other movie that's coming on the next couple of months that's going to warrant that need to go watch in 40X. So I think if you still want to, the chances is, is there. Have your moment. Do you hear my cat? I do not hear your cat. Uh, is, is he Can... me? Oh, a lot. <laughs> oh really? He's enjoying the conversation. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh no, wait, um, I just I just heard it. Hey. <laughs> Hi. I don't know if you can hear him. Um, <laughs> but my plan, if they come out with Twister and Twisters in the movie, I'm spending a whole day with the X. And start with the original. And then go to the other. And you know what? In between that break, that's when I have my popcorn and my go. soda and so my m and <laughs> That's thinking. Yeah, just, that's thinking ahead. You're just going to eat your popcorn in the lobby <laughs> <laughs> to your car. We're going to have. We're going to find a table outside and enjoy it for what it is. Between each movie, but not in walk. the movie theater. <laughs> not in the movie theater. Do not. I'm, I'm telling you, it's not worth it. It's going to land on the floor. And then you'd be like, you're damn, I just 40 bucks. Exactly. Now you're getting it. Um, but let's let's dive into some of the details of this movie. Uh, going back to the beginning, we did get a get get a, uh, a kind of an Easter egg at the very beginning when they open up the film and we see Dorothy number five. Obviously, if you remember from the first Twister movie, we saw Dorothy number one, two, three and four. And they went through all of those movies or all of those devices in the first movie. And it seemed like by the end of the film, of the first film, they landed on something that would have worked to retrieve data going into a tornado. Mm-hmm. And then for some reason, 20 something years later, we have Dorothy number five. We have no reason why they have this device and why after 20 years, they stopped at five. You would think that they would make more iterations, but they said, nope, we perfected it with four. We built, we build a better one in five and then that's it. So, Kellyanne, I'll, the, the question that I'll ask you is, can you actually collect data like that? Or is it possible to maybe collect data like that for a tornado? I've never seen that happen. <laughs> um, so I'm going to have to go and say Hollywood. Also, no one I feel like that I know that Storm Chases chases for research. They just do it for fun and oh. to see Mother Nature at work. There are a lot of storm chasers that just do it for fun or do it to make money off of videos when they sell it to um news. But um as far as I know, I don't I don't think that's real. But if you know someone watching this is also a meteorologist and says, no, 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 I've done this before, like please let me know because I'm very curious <laughs> and then I want to know like how you make that work. And I just I would I would love to know. But uh, yeah, as far as I know, no, I don't think so. Mm. So, wait, you're saying that anyone who chases a storm is not for research purposes? Or most of the time it's not for research? Uh, most of the time it's not for research purposes. I mean, like, yeah, you'll, I'm sure you'll come across, you know, people doing some sort of research. But I feel like a lot of the, the storm chasers that I know are just doing it for the thrill and just to see, like, Mother Nature's beauty. And that's mm. why I did it um, when I was in my first market in Lubbock, Texas. Like, I just, I love tornadoes, and they're so fascinating to me. And to see Mother Nature, like, in real time and it's just phenomenal. Like I, there's no other way to describe it when you see it in person from a safe viewpoint. Um, so most people do it for fun. Yeah. But were you doing that for work when you, yeah. When you okay. Uh, yeah. So I worked as a meteorologist, uh, on air meteorologist in Lubbock, but also during, you know, my free time or, um, for like actual broadcasting purposes, like I would go and chase tornadoes. Well, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> were were there any things that within this movie that you were able to like? Oh, well, this because I've done this in before, and we're and the events that were happening in the movie, we were able to late with a few of those things that they were doing in any in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, a little bit. I think um, you know when, when we see Kate looking at the the sky and saying, Oh yeah, you know, like this one's not going to form because the cap's not going to break, which is basically a cap is, I think they explain it in the movie. Um, basically a cap just allows or doesn't allow storms to form. It's a stable layer of air, um, in the levels of the atmosphere. So if it's strong enough, the cap doesn't what you call or what you hear, uh, it's called break. And that just keeps 
no storms from developing, but if the cap breaks, then you get severe storms developing. Um, so you can't necessarily see that, but you know, if you see the way that the wind's blowing and kind of things like that, like kind of, um, but you know, I, I personally rely on a lot more technology <laughs> <We're not laughs> than just, just like my senses. Yeah. <laughs> We're not just feeling for the wind and be like, yep. Yeah, there's a tornado coming. I can feel yeah, it. I don't, I I don't pick up it. a dandelion and just like, you know, watch it go into the wind and say, it's going to be severe weather today. Yeah, it's, it's going to. I think that was the type of science that the National Weather Service in this movie was using on Kate uh, and her skills when trying to formulate uh, whether or not a storm was going to be issued for a warning or not. Um, yep. Again, I'm still <laughs> concerned about this. In, in the National Weather Service in this movie, I'm very concerned without Kate being there. We need answers. Here. We need answers, absolutely. Um, so, yes, we get the opening scene, and uh, we see that they're chasing a tornado. They're using Dorothy to, to collect information, which you already said that was a bunch of random images on the screen that meant nothing. And and then they go under to the, the – they're trying to evade the storm. People start getting sucked in, and then they go into an overpass. And I think we when we had this conversation before was, is that actually a safe place to go, given the options that they had in the film – or just in general, should people go under and over, uh, go in and under overpass to seek safety for a tornado? So in the movie, they say, uh, you know, an underpass is not, you know, safe from a tornado, but they were basically like in this wide open field with no, no building. I mean, essentially you want to try to get in a building, but if that's your, you know, only thing, you know, to, to try to shield yourself, um, and the way that it was built was very interesting because you had this little gap, like they weren't just standing underneath the overpass. They mm-hmm. had like this little gap and they were holding on to something. So um, I haven't seen overpasses like that before, but also there's not many times that I've stood underneath an overpass and really analyzed it. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, really what you want to do is try to just get inside some sort of shelter. If that's your only if that's your only option, you know, fight or flight mode, right? Mm-hmm. So you're not going to outrun the storm. It's like, you know, the next best thing. So in the context of the film, that was okay. That was okay in the context of the film, but I feel like they were very strategic about how they, how they mapped out that, that, that scene. Right. Right. Um, so after that scene among the survivors were Kate and Javi, obviously Kate went to go work for the national weather service. Javi was still kind of storm chasing, but under now a corporate level, they said, he said now working for a, uh, for a business. What, sorry, what's it called? Par. Thank you. Storm par that tries to collect data to further understand, uh, the, the storms. And I, I forgot what was the reason for that. I just, it was like a better version of Dorothy. I don't remember exactly why uh, or what science that they were using to do that but it was the only thing i remember is that when he was trying to convince kate in the dining uh, in the diner at the diner he put like these three little like i don't know salt and pepper shakers napkins i don't remember and then if you form a triangle you can collect all the data from that um and if you remember the science kellyanne is that even possible to do in the context of the movie so they're trying to create a 3d scan of the atmosphere that's right and with those solar panel looking things in a diamond, like that's not really 3D. Like 3D, you're measuring, you know, height, width, and like all these other different dimensions in the atmosphere. And like creating a triangle, just because there's three points in a triangle, doesn't mean that you're creating something 3D. <laughs> so, so the answer is no. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> that, that, that that won't that won't get you anything. No, but um, I I feel like our technology now is actually pretty good of getting a three D um, kind of scan of the atmosphere. And actually, I was just working with um, one of our meteorologists on a tornado warning last weekend during hurricane coverage, mm. and we essentially had a three D scan of the storm and so what we were showing was so like when you look at a radar oh we're getting pen and paper, paper coming up yes. pen and paper coming out okay yes so let's say gosh um i'm not an artist okay <laughs> this is your hook echo mm-hmm. so 
for those that don't know what that is, it's essentially the tornado. So, like, if there was a tornado on the ground in the plains, you would technically see a hook because here's the inflow right here, and that's the tornado. Oh, can you see? Yeah, that's the tornado. Yeah. So this is really hard to do backwards. But so your <laughs> inflow is going to be at that little notch right there that goes in the, the tornado. Oh, okay. And then that little where the circle is, that is your like actual tornado. So like pretending like this is a, a storm, uh, a tornado on a radar, we're looking at this from the top down on a radar. But with a 3D scan, like what we had um, that we showed on TV, you are taking that top down viewpoint and you're now tilting it to where you're looking at it through the atmosphere. I don't know how to describe it. I'm a really <laughs> bad person to describe things, but um, you're going from that top down viewpoint and just tilting it. So it's like if you're flying a plane and like you look out the window and you see like the clouds like horizontal with you, like that's like what we did. So like mm. that would be like a good example of like a 3D scan, um, but putting um, three radars together is not a 3D scan. <laughs> noted and thank you for the demonstration um, I tried. <laughs> uh so ultimately javi was able to convince her through i don't know guilt in a way uh to, <laughs> right am i wrong because that's what i feel like what he did like he kind of guilted her into coming back and thinks that like hey we both went through trauma with this experience and and they did they did highlight that uh that it's like hey i'm not the only person that lost people that day either and we can tell that they're both going through the same situation but in different ways and he wants to she kind of wants to leave it behind and he wants to push through so this doesn't happen again to other people and if you can collect all the information um and then it then she agreed to come along with him just for one week to work with that and i don't know i think that that was fine as far as like I, Javi's a very interesting character throughout this movie. Um, you're kind of either on his side. You can tell if there's some attraction that Javi has for Kate in this. So that, that kind of plays into it a little bit. Uh, we even saw the beginning of the movie when he ha when she was with her boyfriend and then got swept away. Like you can see that he even was looking at her during those moments as well. So like th throughout this moment, that was a theme of like and also this love triangle that kept going on that we'll get into a little bit later. Um, but but I think. But, yeah. but I think that he, it was more, I saw it as more of like a professional relationship. Like maybe he admired, maybe he admired her like he, as a peer mm -hmm. because he, I, at least they never alluded like deliberately that he was inter interested in her romantically. I mean, even at the end right. when he's like telling Glenn, pa he's telling Glenn Powell, he's like, go ahead and get her. Like, you know, when he's in, he just happens <laughs> to be in the car. Was he like eating a bag of chips yeah. or something? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah. Some weird eating a bag of snacking? chips. Like, like, yeah, you go. <laughs> he's snacking because he's sad because he can't have Kate. That's why. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> <laughs> She's supposed to be mine. <laughs> I respect her. <laughs> eating my feelings. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> So, so we get to the point where they're introducing everybody else in the, in the movie. And then all of a sudden we get to, and I was like, we were saying the main event, Glenn Powell comes in here, coming in with his camera crew, his YouTube thing. He's getting interviewed by a reporter that we see throughout the movie. And he says his famous line. It says, if you could feel it, chase it, chase it. That's right. Um, preaching to all of his followers and uh, and then they kind of go on this exciting journey which again I I do believe that once he comes into play and you see the kind of back and forth that Kate and Tyler have like she's going through through a more of a like a simplistic approach she has like some some sense with nature like that she can predict these things like Pocahontas uh, <laughs> feeling the colors of the wind <laughs> that's right and it's all gray and, yeah. and, and, and black and, and green I guess I don't know it's not a lot of colors in this, in this movie it's not, not known for its colors um, and then they kind of go on this exciting chase and I feel like that's when we get the kind of get the duality between the two characters at the time at, that we think that these two characters are we have one approach of this YouTube environment where something that we kind of didn't get much in the first movie mainly because it was kind of the roles were reversed anyway. I think Bill Pax and Helen Hunt and their team was kind of like the rebels mm -hmm. of the group. And then we had the professionals over here. Uh, I don't know what they were, I don't know who or what they were working for um, in that movie, in the first movie, but they were like more like, I don't know. Like, anyway, like professional about trying to do storm chasing and 
Bill Paxton and Helen with more of the Rebels. And now I feel like, and we were following more of their their story. And now I feel like the roles were reversed. We're now we're following more of the professional people. And then we have Glenn Powell and his team being the reckless ones. And I think that was a cool way to give us that visually of like, here are these two factions trying to go after the same thing, but has different alternatives to it at the time of we are at the time at this point in the movie was it really interesting to see him in the eyes of that reporter as like you know you're going back and forth <laughs> between both camps and he's like on this wild ride and they're telling him to strap in and he's like freaking out and you know and then they shoot fireworks into a tornado <laughs> right which now comes to our second question or next question or, ne- uh, or sorry I mean. our next question <laughs> kellyanne <laughs> i'm sure that's a good answer it but <laughs> Um, can, <laughs> Kellyanne, can you fire? Well, I guess there's two things that happened in that in, in that scene. One, they planted the vehicle planted itself into yeah. into the as a her as the tornado was coming toward them, they planted themselves to the ground so they wouldn't move. So is that possible? And then the second thing that they did was shoot off fireworks. And can you do that in a tornado? So two questions. Okay, so first question about planting yourself. Um, the only reason why I say yes, you can do that. There's like a little asterisk there because, you know, if it is a stronger tornado, you don't want to, you know, drive and be in a, hurt, uh, in a tornado. Um, but the only reason why I say yes is because there is a guy named Reed Timmer. And he is notorious for storm chasing. So this kind of all goes back to storm chasing for fun. This guy does not do this for research. Like he literally does it for pure enjoyment. And he takes this truck that you're seeing right now. And he has built this car truck thing to plant in the ground and do basically what Tyler does and have it go through a tornado um and he had like a whole show on it um and that's actually what like really fascinated me about tornadoes and i think that's why like i i really find them so interesting um i personally would never do that <laughs> but also there are just some adrenaline junkies out there and reed just happens to be one of them this is crazy this according to this it says this heavenly armored vehicle can drive into a weak to relatively strong tornado ef0 to ef3 to film it to take measurements. Wow. Uh, first generate. This is a first generation storm research. It's a modified 1997 Ford F Super Duty cab and chassis. It's got two wheel drive, two axles, six wheels, 7.3 power stroke diesel. It's a five speed manual. It's 14 feet high and 14,000 pounds. <laughs> that's, oh my God. That's wow. incredible. <laughs> if that's not an endorsement for Ford. To be like, hey, our vehicles built can tough. <laughs> built up. Built up. Have you seen the built tornado intercept? Tornado. <laughs> yeah. Intercepts tornadoes. Oh, that was it. That's it. That's the endorsement that they need. <laughs> um, well, then I guess that answers your question. I didn't know that he actually did it for research. Um, Reed Timmer, though, is a very smart guy. Like he is, he has his. Um, phd like he's done research and stuff so i guess that you know that answers your question there are some people that do it for research but also a lot of adrenaline too <laughs> uh and then the second oh, question, and then yeah. second question yes um i don't know i would love to though see if that could actually happen my thing is like if you can where do the fireworks go do they get wrapped up in the tornado or is there just here's my thinking there's too much moisture mm. in the tornado to where the fireworks can actually like light. Um, but I also don't know. I, I've never done that before, but that's my theory and I'm going to stick with it. Okay. <laughs> so don't know, but we'll love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd love to see it. Safe and if there's a video of it, that's not in the movie. Please said it to me. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, and at, at the very least, it was very entertaining to watch kind of them going back and forth. We also got Javi's perspective where he was trying to coordinate this triangle formation that Kellyanne says it's bullshit. And, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> and they did use code names um, uh, based off Wizard of Oz characters. I believe it was the Tin Man, the Lion, the Scarecrow, maybe the Wizard as well. Um, all kind of sticking with the theme of uh, Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz as well. Uh, so that was kind of a nice nod to the original film. And, uh, and then we see Kate have kind of this anxiety attack, didn't want to get too close to the tornado and so they kind of backed off and then they weren't able to get to their uh the data that they were looking for as well as i forgot his name but he was like kind of like a the mit uh, guy the mit guy yeah he was kind of like a little stuck in the mud for like uh, you know the entire cameo, movie you know who that cameo is sir that's, that's, oh, that's super that's <laughs> that's so oh my god i was literally i just read the name and i did not even put two and two together until you said it, and I like, I think I realized it as you're about to say yeah. it. It's like, so, so Superman himself, the future Superman, is kind of being like an asshole in this movie. So that's interesting. Wow, I I took that a whole new light now. That, that's <laughs> look at that. Like the more, the more, the, <laughs> the change of. Movie. It's like, what like, is I Superman? actually like this guy. It's like, what now. is my life? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Superman, what are you doing? Be nice. They want to help people. <laughs> um, and so then, uh, then we fast forward to eventually we have this, we see this, this type of relationship that's brewing between Kate and Tyler. We get to know a little bit more about Tyler, um, how he's not just a tornado chaser. Um, and he is actually, he's smarter than he actually looks. He's from some heart behind him, some emotion behind it. We see, we get a little bit more of his backstory and then we get to the rate, the, the rodeo scene where they are having a good time at the rodeo. looks like they're kind of going on a date, but not really. They're just kind of feeling each other out, I guess at this point. And then all of a sudden, no warning whatsoever. There is a, was it, was it, was it a five? I'm not sure if they, uh, I, I, I think so. Okay. Uh, like there was just a trailer that came out of nowhere. Was what, what was it? it sorry. Like four. EF4. Okay, so big old tornado comes out of nowhere and just starts creating havoc. And you can see the destruction that it was making in that scene. So, Kelly, I kind of want to break down that scene. The fact that they kind of came in without warning. The the They were trying to go into the hotel for safety. People weren't listening. They were panicking. People died there. Eventually, they were trying to find a bunker, but yet went into an empty pool. That was all dried out, and they, you know, they they seek shelter. They seeked shelter there. So, kind of uh, dissecting that scene for us at a meteorological standpoint. Um, well, I think it's so funny because a lot of people say this that these storms come without warning. Um, can they pop up out of nowhere? Yes, but we are in 2024. Our technology, our forecasting is so good that. I think we know when we're going to have a severe, not I think, we know when we're going to have a severe weather outbreak and we can really detect, you know, where it's going to be, the timing of it. It's just whether or not, you know, people pay attention. Um, so I think from that standpoint, like, hey, we're at a rodeo and all of a sudden there's a tornado coming. I don't know about that. Um, I mean, we, we talk about it all the time on TV. Like when we know that there's going to be a big severe weather threat, like we're talking about it days in advance. Um, but I mean, absolutely, these tornadoes in themselves can certainly pop up out of nowhere. Essentially, you just need to be in the right place at the right time for the tornado to drop down and then, you know, move through. But if the conditions are there, it's absolutely possible to have that uh, severe weather potential. Um, it's so funny that you mentioned the pool because when they were going down to the pool, first of all, they were looking for shelter. They asked if they had a storm, uh, a, a storm shelter, which if you live in the plains and you don't have a storm shelter, that honestly could be a matter of life or death. Um, I've seen so many photos and videos of like these towns just decimated. And the only thing standing is a storm shelter and these people walk out alive from them. Um, so, you know, they asked if they have a storm shelter they don't have one, then they, you know, like try to find the next best thing. And I, for some reason, that's a pool. And I said, why are you going into the pool? Like, I'm literally talking to myself as I'm watching the movie. I'm like, why are you going into the pool? It doesn't make any sense. But the, but almost like the opening scene of the underpass, like there's this piece of the pool that they can hide under 
So like you have like your pool deck and then you have the pool, but somehow there's like this piece of pool deck that they could just like hide under. I've never seen a pool like that. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, like a crack in the wall. Uh, and then they, they hide into. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, you know, right place, right time. Um, and then they had some pipes that they could hold on to, which also I thought was a nice, I don't know if they did this on purpose or what, but it was a nice little nod to the original movie at the end where there's that tornado coming in this mm-hmm. open field and there's those pipes and they, they're either holding onto the pipes or they handcuff themselves to the pipes. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I thought that was like a nice. He had his belt and they wrapped themselves around with the belt on the pipes and like the, that, the tornado was like sweeping them away. They would have been sucked up um, if they hadn't done that, which I, in a way that feels more realistic uh, in the yeah. context of that scene in the first movie, rather than going into a pool where also a truck kind of came in and almost took them out mm-hmm. as well. Like, I think a, like a, a whole truck kind of capsized and went, you know, and try to, it was also in the pool as well. After the motel yeah. got sucked away. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Or or, yeah. or or that couple who decided not to listen to them and they said follow us and they decided to go in their car That's and then they, they got... As soon as they drove, uh, yeah. flew off into the sky. Yeah. <laughs> the mm-hmm. amount of people that got sucked up into tornadoes in this movie, like, take a shot for every time someone got sucked up in this tornado. <laughs> well, that's a game. <laughs> <laughs> that's a game. Like, yeah. that's a scary game. Yeah. I mean, um, you're already three shots in in the, first, in the first 10 minutes of the movie, so... R.I.P. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I, I, you know, those are my thoughts on it. Um, it's so, just perfectly placed Hollywood. Yeah. So the, the going down in a pool, not recommended at whatsoever. I would not recommend that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if that's, if that's your best bet, Kate, Tyler, you know, <laughs> happy it worked out for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As well as the people that they saved along the way as well. I think there was like a, a mother and and a, a daughter that was with them. I think as well as – I'm not sure if the hotel owner was also with them at that scene or if he ended up getting sucked away He's the one who, toward the someone end. Someone got sucked yeah, away. It was the whole, I yeah. think it was the motel owner. He went down there with him and then Glenn Powell tried to go out of him and get him. And then he got – he like lifted himself up instead of staying close to the ground and then he got swept away. Okay. All right. Now, I, I, I did say earlier on that we're not going to try to replicate uh, conversations we had prior, but I think it was around this moment where we actually talked about real-world uh, safety, uh, that what you would actually do in a tornado instead of just going down the pool. So I kind of just want to go over that again uh, because I think that was really important to, to, like, when there is a tornado out there, instead of going to a pool or an underpass or whatever, what should you be doing if a tornado is in your area? I feel like I'm in like one of my school talks right now yes, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> or just like whenever there's a tornado warning issued and we have to be on television until it's either expired or canceled. And it's like, it's not existed anymore. So I'm just like, what, what do I talk about? Well, we can talk about tornado safety. So, um, yes. this is what we're going to do. Uh, so for tornado safety, Strapped you, in. here we go. <laughs> okay. This is going to sound crazy, but a helmet. Have a helmet just in case there is flying debris. Mm -hmm. Your head is the most important thing. So a helmet, if you have one of those available. Uh, But what you need to do is go to the lowest level of your home. If you have a basement, great. If you have a storm shelter, great. If you have a storm shelter in a basement, even better. Um, But in Florida, we don't really have basements. So I would best recommend to get into the lowest level of your house, of your home, and the most interior away from windows away from outer walls um, because the most dangerous part of a tornado is going to be the flying debris and i've seen so many photos of like two by fours just pierced right into a into a window or a wall and it's like inches away from like someone's bed so just stay away from outer walls um storm shelter if you have it and um as soon as that tornado warning drops take action yeah, I think also this is a good time to because we were kind of having this conversation as well of like local meteorology when it comes down to weather and severe weather. It's it's kind of like when like we were talking about how news kind of over the years has changed, like how we ingest that news, whether you, we used to turn on the TV to get the six o'clock news and how or in the morning and we get all these different. Now you can go on social media, get your news from this site, this site, this site. But when it comes to weather, though, I feel like you don't. 
you don't just go online and see, oh, well, where is the storm? You can do that. But if you want like the most up-to-date information, I know more people that just tune on to the news to get that those facts um, immediately. And I think that's so important to recognize where you get your weather news from because it is life and death situations here. Absolutely. And I, and if you're in that situation where you are in a tornado warning, most people are going to panic and say, oh, you know, like, uh, yeah, I don't know what to do. They're not going to be thinking about, OK, how do I track this storm? How do mm-hmm. I, you know, open radar? They're going to be trying to protect their their family and themselves. And so that's that's, you know, just another reason why that we're here. I think weather, especially in severe weather cases, will always be around for broadcast television yes you can get your forecast on your phone like we know that and as far as severe weather like when i go on my app what does it tell me oh there's a severe thunderstorm warning great well where's the severe storm where is it hailing right now um just the other the other morning i had a tornado warning that popped up out of nowhere really like it just there was not a big threat for severe weather but there was just enough spin in the atmosphere from what was left over from debbie that there was some rotation in the clouds so i was watching that all morning long and saying hey folks you know need to need to watch this this one you know could turn into turn into something and it did turn into a tornado warning but in that polygon issued by the national weather service there are towns but that town may not necessarily be impacted. For instance, um, bring out the pen and paper again. <laughs> this was this was the polygon. The dot is where the town that was affected was in. The X is a town that was not affected at all, but they were still in the tornado warning. So I went ahead and I said. Hey, just so you know, our you know our friends out in Christmas where this X is, uh, you are not going to be impacted by the tornado because the tornado is actually moving more towards the east northeast instead of the direct uh, east. So I'm not concerned about a tornado for you, but Bislo, you need to be in your safe place right now. So it's like things like that um, that I, I really feel like are so important for meteorologists and broadcast meteorologists. And I, like you said, I, I do see that uh, uh, weather sticking around for a decent amount of time, Mm -hmm. a long time, um, at least in that aspect. Yeah. I mean, local, local news and especially local meteorology. Like I've seen so many times where you guys issue a warning and then we send a reporter out there and somebody goes, Oh, I heard the warning and I left and that you see that person's life and aftermath and it's completely decimated. And, Whereas had they not gotten that warning, they could have been in that building. Like you essentially, by giving them that information, saved their life. And it's, it's, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's a great thing that you guys do. Like it's, and, yeah, and I know it's hard and you guys spend a lot of time to make sure your forecasts are right. Just so you're giving out the most accurate information, even though you guys get hate, but I mean, you're not a wizard. Like what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was. I wish I was. This is no. not Harry Potter. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but also like going off of that it's not just you're providing information you're also saying it in a calmly and professional manner to where people can trust you on air as you're delivering this information i feel like that's also important because you know if you're if you're that worried about the storm you're stressing out yeah. you don't know what you're doing and it, you reading information is not going to help you with that, like, yes, you, you can probably comprehend it, but you're probably still going to be stressed about it and trying to figure out what the next steps are. And by turning on to the news to get all the latest information on those severe weathers, y- you guys kind of give a comforting voice. Like, I know what we're talking about. This is what you need to do. Here are the steps. And should I be worrying as much as I am right now? And I feel like all of those contributing factors go into live broadcasting when it comes to weather. And like, again, the, it's it's so important that you're not going to get that online. No. It's, it's just not going to happen. So yeah, also your delivery uh, has to it, be like, not, I, I wouldn't even say, I, I want to say entertaining, but it's more of like infotainment, like information that's entertaining mm-hmm. because you know, nobody wants to listen to some monotone person try to deliver it. Cause then you're just going to tune out. Like it's so not only are you giving crucial information, but you also have to be engaging in an entertaining way. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, it's so weird to think of myself as a personality. I really don't like, like my, like calling myself that, like to me, like I am a scientist, like I'm a meteorologist. I just happen to be in broadcasting, but like to, you know, TV stations, like we are a personality. That's what they chose us for our personality, obviously for meteorology or news, also our intelligence, our education and things like that. But at, at at face value, do they like the way you present? Do they not? And mm-hmm. so we are, you know, like a personality. So totally agree. But, it, but yeah, I, I don't mean it in a, in like, in not in a negative way because it, it, you need, you, you have to captivate somebody's, um, you have to captivate them somehow in one way or another. Yeah. I, I know at least for me working at the station for six years, I know there's one thing that when there was severe weather and I know it's actually serious, when Chief Meteorologist Tony Manolfi would take off the jacket and roll up his sleeves, when you see that moment on air, it's you're like, real. "Wait, oh hold on, guys, we should <laughs> we should probably listen. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is this strap is, in, yeah. folks. Sh- strap in. We <laughs> he's about to dive into some really important information because the jacket's off, the sleeves are up. He's not messing around this time. Um, and I always like just just sitting there in the studio. That for me is when I'm, I'm like, I don't know if anyone's paying attention, but they should because. Jackets off. I mean, you, you, could, total, off, you could totally feel that. Like, I've seen, and Kellyanne, I can attest to this. I have seen you go on TV from walking in the door, putting your stuff down, and you've got severe weather, no makeup, hair still up. So it's like, obviously, you care more about the information than you do about yeah. how, you're, how you look to present the information when it comes to a moment where you have to decide what's important, how you look, or the information. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, you know, like, that's my job. Uh, and it, it's like not even second guessing. It's just like, okay, like this is what I have to do. And yeah. these people are scared. I know if I didn't know a lot about weather and meteorology, I would be scared too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But we're, we're there to help people out, make them feel calm. And if I have to go on television without hair and makeup, it's literally not the worst thing in the world. You know, yeah. um, I honestly wish I could do it more often. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, just thank, like Ernesto was saying, thank you for all the work you guys do. Um, and again, just going to put it back out there. Thank you for coming back on the podcast and explain. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to let that I'm gonna, go. It's, I'm going to find the horse that you keep beating. It's dead. <laughs> so it's, it's dead and decimated. <laughs> <laughs> like the cow in the first movie. Okay, okay. Back, back, back to uh, back to the movie. So uh, rodeo, pool, all that stuff. That's we're now moving past that. Then we get to uh, Kate and Javi actually having an altercation, learning about some of the things that has been like secretly going on that Kate was unaware about. Uh, we learned that Javi was working for a, a uh, organization that is kind of capitalizing on people's misfortunes when it comes to the tornado like they they're looking they're reaching they're giving out business cards saying like to buy the land kate wasn't really approving of that method at that same time we were learning that tyler's crew was kind of helping the community within the destruction selling t-shirts but also it looked like it was like for uh like um greedy purposes and but then again we saw that they were selling t-shirts to give out food to other people in need and like we were seeing a change of the tide here um and ernesto i'll just go go to you how do you feel like that situation was handled especially since we were given javi a, a certain perspective in the beginning of the movie now we're starting to see a shift in his character well i think that scene just kind of kind of sets up the the whole dynamic difference between um javi and um uh, glenn powell's character tyler where tyler yep um you know, she already had this misconception of him that he was doing it for the wrong reasons and that Javi was doing it for the right reasons. When in that moment, in, the, in those instances, she's realized that it's actually the reverse. You know, they're selling mm-hmm. merchandise so that they can give um, free food and water to a, a, a immediately affected areas and getting people information. Like, that's what people need. They need information. They need help with, they need resources to help get them back on their feet. And whereas, you know, Storm Par and Javi, they have this this tycoon who's coming in and just trying to, hey, your land just got destroyed. It's not going to be worth this much anymore. I'll pay you this much, and then you can just sell your land to me and go restart your life somewhere else. So yeah, and also that was it was like a like in in Javi's sense that they were that money was being invested into collecting the data for the storm, yeah. but also it came at a cost. Yeah, um, that it looked like he was willing to 
to go into rather than probably doing the right thing, and what's, which we later see. Yeah, go ahead. no, and what's just that I just realized, like, you even at this point, you're looking at Javi as the professional because he's he yes. has the degree, he's with this official company, and where you have Tyler, who's like the outlaw, the rodeo cowboy, storm chaser, <laughs> and like he's actually the one who's doing the right thing. And he's right. you know, and they bring a point to say that, you know, what did he say? Like, not everybody who needs a meteorology degree or or not everybody's got that fancy degree or, you know, some people just do it for the love of the storm and kind of just like in embracing the storm chasing community, like as a whole, right. as people, as, as intelligent people who maybe maybe there's somebody who didn't have the opportunity or whatever the case may be, but still is a person who seeks that knowledge and wants to mm-hmm. use that knowledge and awareness to help others. That's kind yeah, of and then within that scene. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can agree to that. Um, and then we see Kate. Uh, stealing Javi's truck and going home and she's driving somewhere in Oklahoma. And, um, and we get to the point of the movie where I feel like a lot of us were probably, we felt that it was being teed up of like Helen hunt is probably going to be the mother of Kate yeah. or Bill Paxson might be the father. And like, we don't know who was going to be coming up, but we figured that somebody from the previous film was going to appear. And it wasn't, it was just, a a, a random character just just a lady um who is just i uh, just i'm uh, just your mother uh in this scenario and i feel like do you <laughs> i'll never discount the scene just just, just your mother. A mother. Nobody important just a mother <laughs> it's fine no, nothing important uh but i feel like it was I, i've seen this movement talked about online of like they were kind of setting up to this but really it wasn't and ultimately we never get any connections to the first movie and do you feel like that was necessary for this film to have that connection or do you feel like ultimately it kind of just worked well on its own without having that connection? Ernesto. Um, okay. No, I was literally about to say who, go who, ahead, Kelly. who is this for. <laughs> yeah. Kelly, you can say. Um, I, you know, I don't think it's necessary. I think it would be like a cool little like nugget. Um, but I don't think it's necessary in short. Yeah. I don't think it's necessary, but I think, her going home is a necessary plot point because that leads to Kate and Tyler going into the barn and him learn about all her experiments and all her like cloud physics and whatever she had on the board. She had like a bunch of, she, she had numbers and figures on the board. Some kind of math shit was happening over there. Um, <laughs> it was cloud physics. <laughs> I think, yeah, I thought, it was cloud um, physics. So the, whereas that part wasn't necessary because it did, it did feel like, very like she walks in and it's this open scene and then her mom like walks in the frame like oh look it's her mom but you know they were like the moment like they built the moment they're like ah we'll just leave it it's fine (laughs) no and i know i know they're playing with the audience they have to of course like because you could have easily just made it as simple as here is a photo of them as a family like bill paxton her mother and her like just just like a photo in the background to have that loose connection maybe not even bring it up and say you know your dad would be proud of you and that's it um but they didn't go that route either Which, not saying it was necessary but i feel like we could have had some easy little wins there if you wanted to tie the events of the first movie into the second movie which is really um, which is really interesting because um bill paxton's son cameos in this movie he does. You're right. So as wait, the, you know, where? Okay, I can. I, I didn't see it. And I actually had to look it up. I don't really. I don't actually remember him from the movie, but I do know that it was a thing. Yeah, original. This is the People magazine. Original Twister star Bill Paxton's son James makes a cameo in Twisters. Um, and who? I don't remember who he played. He played. Um, James portrays it. He's the angry motel guest. That's who he was. <laughs> Oh. He was the angry guy from the oh. motel. <laughs> oh, so he got swept away and died. Well, that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yep. the one that he had, like, his girlfriend, and then they went into the car, and then the car swept the... The train swept the car away. He does kind of look like his um, father. Like yeah, he does really kind of... He does. Yeah, yeah he does. Yeah, um, definitely has that smile. Yes, absolutely. Um, And he just, uh, you know, in the article, just talks about, you know, how emotional it was and how embracing the... Um, the cast were to him. Um, but yeah, I don't remember where I was going. Oh, I don't like, it's interesting that they didn't include him in the story. Whereas his son is literally in the movie. I don't Maybe mm-hmm. there is a contract. There had to have been a reason why. Cause it like, there's just so much set up there already. I do know that Helen hunt. I did read that she was originally offered it, but then she turned it down. 
Oh, I did not know she was she she turned it down. Okay, well, I mean that okay, that was that's a choice. That's not fun. Yeah. <laughs> a Helen Hunt. Come on. Come on. Come on, Helen. God. Um, so let's go back to that cloud science that you were mentioning earlier, uh, because now we're going to go back to Kellyanne. <laughs> and like, <laughs> there was a lot of stuff that was being presented. I believe if I refer back to my notes, they, they developed a computer model to simulate cage storm dispersal invention to figure out how to fix uh, from the how to fix a problem from the previous failure. Because in the beginning of the movie, they were trying to to kind of destroy their tornado, dissipate it, whatever. They were trying to make it go away, and it failed. Uh, but they were still able to collect the data, from my understanding. Um, and they uh, they were trying to fix the problem by adding a chemical to turn more of the moisture into rain before dissolving their tornado. We see that later on in the film. But all of that, you know, some of that cloud science. Is any of that hold weight? <laughs> oh, man, cloud physics. Uh, Here we no. go. <laughs> no, sure, no, no. Moving on. Next question. <laughs> um, yeah, no. I mean, think about the atmosphere and just how much air there is, right? And in the air, it holds moisture. Um, I think, actually, I think in cloud physics, and I'm so mad. I'm so sorry, you guys. I came so unprepared this time. Like you would think, like the second time, like I would know to watch in 40x, and I would know to have my cloud <laughs> physics notebook ready, right? Um, but no. No, I didn't. Um, but I'm pretty sure we actually calculated how much like air weighs essentially. Um, and so just to think about it in that aspect, because you can't see it. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, you're like, Oh, that could easily happen. Well, you would need so much of whatever material this is for the atmosphere to um, absolve, absorb, mm -hmm. that's the word. Guys, I've been up since, you know, one o'clock in the morning, so don't mind me and my grammar, okay? I went to school for meteorology, not for grammar, not for English, all right? Tell them. Tell them. Science, grammar, yeah. totally different. Math and writing. Like there's a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science, and I clearly did not get the arts one. Um, anyway, you would need so much of that material to disperse that or like absorb it and but then just think about it you have this just looking at the poster right now you have all of this dynamics all of these dynamics happening of like the twisting and turning so where's all that energy going you know mm -hmm. it's like when people say that they could put a bomb in a hurricane and it's going to stop the hurricane <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry but that is the craziest crap <laughs> that I've ever heard. But if but if someone tries it, let me know. <laughs> so, also, on a side note, I'm sorry, it's, I can't help but to mention it. Of uh, right behind you, if this isn't a glowing, I know, I know, so you're gonna say, if this is an glowing endorsement for Apple uh, AirPods, there's there's a lot of lawn maintenance happening behind you. There's a lawnmower going. We have people cutting the weeds. You're watching, the grass. you're seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see all of this commotion happening, and I don't hear a single thing yeah. right now. I love this. If, if this was from like, because I'm using this microphone, if the lawn, if they're mowing the lawn out there right now, you hear all of it. Yeah. So right now we are only hearing your voice. We barely even heard the cat earlier. So like, this is a glowing endorsement that you know what AirPods. Apple AirPods are pretty good right now pretty for kind of canceling out all other sound that's coming into this. Apple needs to endorse me right now. Yes. You're welcome, Apple. You're, yes. Okay. So just take this the conversation and like you don't even hear it. You just hear you just hear a voice. No, nothing on the outside. Yeah, literally nothing else. Fantastic. Um, but yeah, so okay, so basically you're saying that the the science that they were trying to build into this movie, sucking the moisture out to dust to destroy it, not a thing that can actually happen. No, not a real thing in science, um, but in Hollywood, absolutely. For the, <laughs> the average person, probably. Um, but there's a lot more that goes into um, tornadoes and weather than just, oh, we have this thing. It's going to go into the tornado, and it's going to get rid of the tornado. Simple. It ain't that simple. And if it was that simple, I probably would have aced all my classes. <laughs> <laughs> I took um, bees instead. <laughs> So now we 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 have this formula that they're working. Uh, Tyler and Kate were able to uh, work together with uh, with the help of Javi's information that she called him up and said, hey, 
uh, you know, no hard feelings, but sorry, I stole your truck, but I'm going to need your, your data so we can get some real information out here to do some real good. Um, even before all that, we see Kate and Tyler forming a new connection. They're following the storms, seeing that, that the relationship build. Uh, eventually, now we see Kate in, we had this interesting scene early in the movie where we see Kate in the passenger seat of Javi's truck as they're going, you know, traveling to the first storm. And they, she looks over to the car and she sees Tyler in her truck and his truck kind of as they both are start chasing their first storm. And then we see the roles reversed while now they're chasing the other storm. And we see uh, Kate in the passenger seat of Tyler's truck and then Javi and, and Superman in the other car. And so they're both driving. And then uh, we see a, Big tornado coming in. I believe this one was a was a was an EF five, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. At the end of the movie. That's the big one. Uh, and then it goes through an oil refinery, and we get, as you saw in the trailers, the fire tornado. So, Kellyanne, can that happen? Can we have a fire tornado? In that context, I am going to go on the cautious side and say no. Um, but fire tornadoes or Fire nados absolutely can happen, and you usually see it in wildfires um, because you have this hot air mass, and then you have the cool air mass, and basically it's just uh, heating differentials, and it just creates like a little like a little ro- rotation. So uh, it does happen, just not to that scale. And usually, if there are fire nados that happen, they're pretty quick. Uh, there's exactly like they're so tiny. They're not mm. anything massive like in that movie. But it's it's just because of the different heating uh, and the different temperatures in the air mass. You have your your hot rising air and then your cool sinking air. And that helps to create a little bit of twist. And it also goes for the same as dust devils. Um, it's basically just I've, I've seen it on a clear blue day <laughs> uh, in, in Texas and in the dirt. There's just swirling dirt around, and there's no storm. There's nothing, and it's just like a little dust devil due to different temperatures. Well, those look crazy as Ernesto's going through some of the Google images there. Um, They're pretty scary. It's pretty wild. Yeah, no. If, it really makes if, you if I saw reconsider that, your life. <laughs> yeah, I was like, no, no, thank you. We're 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 done here. We're gonna just go the other way. Um, and then we get to an interesting point in the movie. We see the the uh, EF5 tornado going toward a small town, and we see Kate and Tyler rushing toward there. And then we get to the point of Javi, where I feel like this was the the moment where I feel like he needed, in essence, a win here uh, for his character. Because it, I feel like he was presented as a sympathetic character, doing it for the business. We learn more about what the business is. And then uh, we have Superman. What is his real David, name? I, forget. I just keep Cornset. calling him Superman. Yeah, well, the the character name. Oh. We have... Uh, <laughs> Scott. Oh, His I name is Scott. M- oh, MIT yep, guy. That's yeah, definitely an MIT, MIT guy. guy. Yeah, 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 MIT guy. <laughs> MIT guy Scott, aka Superman. Um, uh, he uh, is kind of like, dude, what are you doing? You're following this girl around, looking at her instincts. You know, uh, you know, following her instincts. Like, what are you doing? We have all this data, all this stuff, and then he ends up just leaving him to the dust. We actually, I don't think we ever see him again. Uh, and Javi's going in and starts saving the day with Kate and Tyler. And I think that was a good move for his character because I feel like that in a way he was kind of presented as like Ernesto was saying, like the bad guy at some point. And I feel like that wasn't fair for his character. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy that he was able to get a redemption moment here of like, he knows what the right thing to do is rather than just following the data. Cause I didn't feel like that's where the national progression of his character was. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was happy to see that he kind of got his come up. It's in that scene. And then we get this crazy scene that follows with the EF five tornado kind of, decimating this town we see the water tower just coming down hollywood style um and then if there was one thing i learned from the movie and kellyanne you can back this up uh that if there's tornadoes happening going to a movie theater i i like i kind of sense a lot of safety in my own just for me i get a lot of safety going into the movie theater you get swept into this world of movies um and art that you're happening on the screen but when it comes to a tornado maybe not the best place to go as evident in the film yeah, I would definitely say probably not the best move. Um, 
But that's Hollywood, baby. That's showbiz. <laughs> that's, that's, showbiz. that's what they do. That's what they <laughs> do. <Fun story. laughs> um, I think it was kind of in a way poetic that in the first movie they were at a drive-in and our tornado came in. I believe they were playing The Shining. In this case, I believe it was playing Frankenstein or some some movie in the, the, the sign, uh, whatever the phrase is, it's alive. It's alive. I don't know if it's actually Frankenstein or the movie. I feel like a, a bad person for not knowing the details of that movie, but either way, it was a classic movie that it was playing. It was the, the, the screen was getting destroyed. People were getting swept away. Kate was like, I have this experiment. I'm going to go in there, put myself in the middle of an F five <laughs> and or F five and have the tornado go away. And, and that was it. And, yeah, I feel like this was the in the this this point of the movie where it was like this is where all the drama, the stakes were happening, and we got that big Hollywood ending in the which she was able to kind of in a way for her character get redemption in a way she wasn't able to get in the beginning of the movie, she got it at the end of the movie. Um, and what I did like about after that scene was that, and kind of what we've been talking about already from what Kellyanne was explaining, was that no one's going to believe you that you were able to take out a storm. Um, and I think they were explaining that there were multiple reasons of how a storm could just be done. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if you can go over some of those, how a storm, how a tornado like that size, or just any in general, just stop forming altogether. Um, so, oh gosh. Um <laughs> In reality or in this in this movie? Well, in the movie, she took care of it, as we saw. Apparently. Yeah, yeah. But I guess in reality, uh, yeah. like, because they were saying that there are other, like, if she was trying to explain her technology and what she was able to find to try to kind of decimate or what's, what I mean with the evaporate their tornado. I'm not even sure what the, the yeah, what, the, yeah. Um, yeah, they're saying that if you try to take that science and bring it somewhere to kind of help for their lives in the future, most people won't believe you. Because they think there could have been a number of other factors that could have put it could have could have been at play to kind of have a tornado just kind of dissipate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, I wouldn't believe that either. Like, you were able to stop Mother Nature. Like, how is that <laughs> possible, right? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the tornadoes need a perfect environment to form. They there's there's three ingredients for storms to form, and then there's another ingredient that you need to have. Um, I guess it's really all the same, but you need one ingredient more than the other. Um, so for storms to form, you need uh, moisture, instability, and shear. Wind shear is basically just the wind, the wind speed and how it changes with height in the atmosphere and also direction. And you need wind shear to create rotation so it could just go into a vi an environment where there's, you know, not enough wind shear. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, I don't have any more of that force to help keep the tornado going. So it's just going to dissipate. Or maybe there's just enough dry air where it evaporates. So it, it really all just depends. Um, but for, for the most part, it would probably be one of those things. There's not enough shear or there's just too much dry air. And, and I think it would be safe to say that at least as of right now, where we are in technology and tracking storms, there's no way that we can actually take down a tornado. Like, and just no, okay, it's not. no, <laughs> but I should because I would be a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, good to know. Good to know that we're not we're not that far in advance that we can just you know tell Mother Nature not today. Um, so then we get to another point of the movie where I see a lot of. <laughs> Uh, articles are surrounding and we get to the end where uh, Javi kind of formed a relationship. You know, well, they looks like they were killed their friendship um, and was dropping off Kate at the airport. We see Tyler there having an altercation with one of the people at the, at the airport saying you have to move your vehicle. And he was about to, and probably who's going to say something to Kate, but chickened out and said no. And then brings back the infamous line. And she, and she was saying, well, if you feel it, chase it as she's watching us uh, walking away, which I think was a great callback in my opinion mm -hmm. uh, to that line. And then he decides to plant his truck in the, uh, in the, what's our drilled it into the ground. It drilled it into the ground into the, so I'm, there's no repercussions on that later. No. <laughs> um, and, and then he goes into the into the airport, uh, finds Kate, and they kind of stare at each other. That we get a, a, a um, what do you call it? like um over an overcom whatever saying that all flights are or most flights are being delayed as a storm is coming together. We see them 
turn around and then presumably just going to go back to his car. And and then we see later in the newspaper clippings that Hobby Taylor and Kate started their own business. They're doing storm chasing again. And it looks like they're all three of them are together in a business relationship and a business partnership. But I see a lot of articles online saying they should have kissed in that moment. So Kellyanne, I'll start with you. What do you think that should have happened or not? Um, and just kind of going off of that. So I love a good Mm -hmm. rom-com. I mean, this wasn't really like a rom-com, but like we saw their relationship developing and I actually really enjoyed the turn of Tyler's character from this bad boy a-hole to a more like caring layers are peeled back and we like finally see the true him. And then when we finally start to see that bond of Tyler and Kate, like, yeah, like I want to know that they're not just friends. Like Mm -hmm. I want to know that they're going to be like more than friends, Mm -hmm. but also at the same time, I don't think that that would, I think how they ended it was perfect because at the end of the day, it's a movie about chasing tornadoes. Like there was just enough romance essentially even though there wasn't like any like physical romance but you could see like them bonding and developing that kind of romance in the movie that didn't take away from what the actual movie is about um so i enjoyed it yes i would have you know like liked to see them confirm their feelings for each other but i I feel like we kind of got that when she said if you feel it chase it Mm -hmm. and then he goes back and chases her yeah. Ernesto, what about you? Um, so they actually, I, I read an article online that they actually have two endings for this movie. We got the one that we saw, and the alternate ending, we got the classic Hollywood, them kissing as they're about to go right on to the storm. But they gave us the ending they did for the exact reason that Kellyanne said. that the, it, It's a movie about her love for chasing storms, and she doesn't, they didn't want her to be defined by her love interests, because Whereas we're trying to appreciate who she is and who she is as an individual, as the storm chaser. I mean, hello, the National Weather Service can't survive without her. So mm-hmm. <laughs> it's obviously a movie. <laughs> it's a movie. It, they, you know, they wanted it to call. They didn't. They didn't want that end. They didn't want that classic Hollywood ending. They wanted it to be about her love for storm chasing. And but I, they still left it open enough where you get the sense that they're going to they're going to be together in the end because they gave there was so much tension between them throughout the entire movie for them yeah. not to it's almost like a disservice if they don't it's like why yeah, are you just it, wasting my was, time then <laughs> <laughs> i believe it was uh steven spielberg who was an executive producer on the movie yes. with uh, and also amblin entertainment who also was a production house on this movie along with universal and others um that they uh They decided like it was Steven Spielberg's call not to have the kiss in the movie for again, for that exact reason. They wanted to stick the story, keep the story with storm chasing, not with the romance. But I don't know me personally didn't hurt. Couldn't. I don't think that would have ruined the movie anyway, shape or form. But I I, I, I respect it. I get it. I can I can respect it. I don't agree with it, but I, I respect it. Um, and yeah, and then the movie comes to a close. Like I said, we get the uh, newspaper clippings and uh, and and that's it. And, and ultimately, it was just a fun ride. Yeah that this movie presented like i was kind of smiling from ear to ear this entire time i really wasn't expecting to be this entertained uh throughout this whole movie um especially for like i i would consider this a sleeper hit in my opinion uh because it wasn't a movie i was really looking forward to heavily in going into the summer season um and it was just like oh it looks like a cheap cash grab but you know us capitalizing on an ip um but ultimately i think especially with Lee Isaac Chung, who was the director of this film, uh, and as well as the director of Minari. Minari was a very uh, a very human story of these immigrants kind of moving to America, and we see them adjusting to to um, to like living in America. And you kind of get kind of swept away into that human story. And I believe he was able to bring that kind of reality, that groundedness into Twisters, as well as giving us the big action mm-hmm. spectacle that we would expect. And so I think the characters were the ones that were kind of driving the movie. And then like when we weren't being absorbed by our tornado, we were getting these really interesting character moments that were, you know, Glenn Powell was giving us the charisma that we were looking for. And uh, Javi was giving us 
what Javi was giving us. I kind of couldn't give us a description. <laughs> uh, but Kate was kind of giving us the emotion of it all. And I guess they're both kind of were when they were kind of kind of hitting us really hard at the very beginning of the movie when we see the death of their friends kind of being swept away from the tornado, kind of showcasing the disaster, the destruction throughout this movie that this, these tornadoes can have. And these were good reminders of that. Um, that is not just all fun and games. There's kind of real world scenarios that can happen when these tornadoes come come about. Um, but I do quickly want to talk about the box office as we typically do. And right now, Twisters uh, has a budget of 155... Yes, $155 million dollars. Uh, it opened to $81 million in the box office, which I believe it was a lot more than it was expecting. At the time of this recording, it has hit $202 million domestically, $79 million internationally, with a grand total of $281.3 million. I, I do feel like that it's it had such a great start mm -hmm. and has, at the moment, has great staying power because I do believe it's still getting some good numbers throughout the weeks. Uh, but... If it was just, I, I, I personally believe if it would have came out just a few weeks, maybe a week or two earlier than Deadpool and Wolverine, I think we'd be looking at a bigger box office numbers here yeah. because it, it was only a week difference between Twisters and Deadpool. So you had the people who probably were thinking about going to the movie theater, maybe don't go as often. And it's like, well, Deadpool, Wolverine, I want to see more. So I'm going to just wait to see that movie instead of seeing Twisters. There's also the other hand of like, uh, like more people, again, more people wanted to, you have your people who saw it initially, but then if you, you were to come back to go see it again, not likely because you're probably going to come back and see Deadpool. And now Deadpool's getting in all the money, all the better press. And I think it just didn't have its time to shine because they really only had that one week. And then once Deadpool and Wolverine came out, it was, it was just sweeping everything. And it's almost like Twisters was kind of forgotten about in a way. Yeah, I think it would have done better had it open like almost like right around Mad Max because of the beginning of the summer movie season. Yes. We, they were good, but they weren't to like Twisters or Deadpool level quality films. Like they, they were mm -hmm. good fun movies. And I feel like if this had come out in the beginning of the summer, it probably would have dominated. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, so a little bit unfortunate because of how good this movie was, in my opinion. Uh, so hopefully it can come back in a way i know that they're already looking at putting this movie on video on demand like by, by as early as next week yeah. if not i mean i can actually just double check real quick it might already be there now well actually no it's not it, it, it did say the 13th and that is that is tuesday yeah so i believe on august 13th you can watch twisters at home and so like that's such a shame because i feel like this is a big blockbuster yeah. movie you should experience in the theater and because of the box office reception universal has that call it's like well it's been over two weeks we can put it on video on demand whenever we want to try to reap in uh some of that cash flow as well but anyway all that to say uh kellyanne we'll start with you your final thoughts on the film uh final thoughts i enjoyed it i don't go to the movies often i don't see movies often there has to be like a movie that i really want to see to go there um, I, I liked it. It wasn't too crazy irrational. It wasn't too, I'm in love with you. Mm -hmm. It had like a nice, it had nice things for everybody. And it was just fun. Like the mm -hmm. soundtrack with it is just so fun. Oh my fun. God. <laughs> I listened to the entire thing. Oh my gosh. That is my pump up song. Absolutely. It makes me want to drive through a tornado and feel like I can come out alive. Like <laughs> it's such a good song. And then you have on that soundtrack, other people like Shania Twain. And um, one of our, I, I worked with this girl who is now married to the drummer of Flatland Cavalry, and they're oh. featured on the album. So it's just nice to see, like, oh, cool. that connection, my childhood connection with Shania Twain, and then, like, these awesome pump-up songs, like the Luke Calm song. So I think that's also really fun as well. Um, overall, I really enjoyed it. I, it made me want to go Storm Chase again. I, I said to my fiancé, I was like, did you want to go Storm Chasing with me next year in the planes? And he was like, Absolutely not. I Absolutely do not want to go. Not. I was like, well, <laughs> I want to go. And he said, I will not be going. So it just, it's, it's, a, it's a fun movie. It really makes me miss the planes. Um, but it also is just like a really good way to get people more interested in meteorology. Yeah. Like, I feel like the original movie sparked so much interest in people my age or just a little bit older than me with that 
that movie. And I, I'm hoping it does the same for some others. Yeah, I, I definitely feel like it opened up a new generation of like people who are interested in meteorology. They can look to this film as as a form of entertainment, but also like we were mentioning earlier, you can learn probably a lot from this movie as well. Um, yeah. But you're uh, out of five stars. Uh, what would you give this movie? So I, I know last time we recorded, I started off saying I'm going to give it like a four point five because I'm a really difficult judge. And then I started talking myself into giving it a five. I was like, there's no reason it shouldn't be a five. So I'm still going to give it a five. Okay. <laughs> like there's no reason for it not to be a 4.5. I still listen to the soundtrack. Mm, yeah. I still, I, I still look at Glenn Powell and his white shirt and his hat. And I'm just like, oh, Matt, okay, you here's it. You didn't, Matt, you didn't even talk about that. That was the, the pinnacle part of the movie, the wet t-shirt contest with Glenn Powell and his cowboy hat. <laughs> That's right. How did I forget about that moment in the movie? <laughs> um, but yeah, I would I would definitely give it a five star still. Ernesto, what about you? Um, so I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a great movie. I really like Lee Isaac Chung. He said um, he did an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, and he said this quote, which I really enjoy. He said, I would love to see more stories in which our identity is defined in relation to the earth and how... And I felt like this film was a chance to do that, hoping that this film inspires people to regard climate scientists as real superheroes. And this kind of ties into our conversation we were talking about earlier, because I 100% agree with that. As I was saying, when I see you guys like address these tornado warnings or we're in the middle of a hurricane, like shit is real. And you guys are telling people real information, how we can get out there and like these are real life superheroes you guys are say actually saving lives through information like knowledge is power how important it is for people to be informed on what's coming their way and you guys are able to deliver that so i think that the movie based off his quote and what he wanted to get across i think that they achieved that so like all the spectacle and like the the pseudo science or the science fiction of it almost is a mute point because the whole point of the movie is recognizing client scientists for the true work that they do. Oh, I hit deep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Thank you. You're welcome. Have a turn up a little bit there. <laughs> no, but it's but it's true. Like, yeah, a lot of it is, you know, oh, it's gonna be sunny weather. Here's the bus stop forecast and like and stuff like that. Beep, but beep. beep beep. But a lot of that is uh <laughs> but like that's fun. But what's really important is when shit gets real and you guys gotta give people the information so that they can so that they can be safe. So I mean, during storms, you're not at home with your family. You're out there at the station. We're on long shift. Very true. We're on 12-hour rotations, the same as everybody else who's different factions who are covering their storms, like emergency emergency services, the National Weather Service, everybody. We're all we're all in the shit together. We're getting we're getting it done, getting the information out there, helping out the people. I mean, the reporters who are literally out in the field. I mean, we could talk about Claire Metz, one of our reporters who used to cover Volusia <clears throat> County. I remember, was it the big storm in Ian? She was literally in heels, like in the middle yep. of the storm. It's like, this lady is a gangster. What is she doing? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like this little petite girl, this little <laughs> petite woman in her jacket, in her like nice work pants and heels in a hurricane. Boy. Boss. Boss. Claire Boss. Metz is a gangster. I don't care what anybody says. That lady is. She is literally is the queen of Volusia County. <laughs> she is. She is. I remember one of the hurricane coverages, and she was like, I believe like she was uh, talking about someone who said they were going to be on their boat during the storm, and he was, and she interviewed him, and then after the storm passed, she went back to see if he was okay in his boat, and we got he was a character, and like that was just that was like. In the midst of like being in like staying in the studio and the kind of good doing the storm together, that was a positive story that came out of it. And he was able to provide some entertainment and in, in, in otherwise a bleak situation. So, yeah, I 100 percent agree. <laughs> she is the queen of Volusia County. <laughs> uh, Vanessa, your five star rating. Oh, uh, I think I'm going to go five. I'm going to go five because it's it's a you know, oh. it's a great summer blockbuster film and given the fact that if you watch it in 40x you're even given uh, an enhanced experience and as much as i love the dolby theater i could, if a movie if the if the infrastructure can give you 
like this deeper appreciation for where you're watching and kind of involve you more into the story, then you have to you have to appreciate the the care that went into that aspect. That's like here's the movie. It's like, well, let's add this other layer to the movie for you guys to really be involved in it. I mean, Matt, do you mm-hmm. I mean, how do you feel? Do you feel like it deterred or enhanced your experience when you saw when you saw it in 40X? Oh, 100 percent enhanced it yeah. like this this was a movie to watch in 40x for sure um and i don't i don't think that every movie should be watched in 40x i know there's some there's like like for example like deadpool wolverine i don't think i was going to get much out of that movie yeah. if i saw it in 40x maybe some of that action, like, it, like the back and forth but not nothing sure. like this this is a whole different no. thing absolutely yeah. exactly so i think for um, that, and I, th- I think for what it can offer to the movie theater experience and to get people out into the theater, a reason to get out into the theater. Very, yeah. very similar to what Barbenheimer did last summer. Give us, give us a spectacle, mm-hmm. give us an event, something, a reason to go out and see this movie this way. There's, so that's the reason why those, all those showings were sold out because it's, mm-hmm. it's all about the encompassing experience that it can provide. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I a hundred percent agree. Like this, this movie, I think, ultimately just took me by surprise. I was not expecting to be entertained like this from start to finish. The 40X experience definitely enhanced it for me. Um, but also, I just had just a fun time yeah. watching this movie. I want to go watch it again. Um, it had enough ties to the original that people can catch little Easter eggs, but it really didn't need it. Um, I also think that, you know, I was seeing a couple articles like there were these uh, this movie was getting these young actors and now they're becoming movie stars with uh, Daisy Edgar Jones and Glenn Powell and even Anthony Ramos. So like they're kind of up and coming and especially Glenn Powell, like he's been on a roll lately yeah. um, and he is bringing it. And I, honestly, if there was a sequel called Twisters, there's, 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 <laughs> or maybe it's called twi- Twisted. <laughs> there's twist, Twister, Twisters and Twisted. Twi- get, get Twisted. Get Twisted. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they're going to have to come up with a different title than what I did. But, like, I would 100% see this style of movie again. Now, I don't know if they can replicate that energy. Like, because uh, at this point, I'm thinking this is going to be, like, a really cheesy movie uh, that I was walking into. And we're just kind of playing around with fire tornadoes. And it's going to be, like, not really taking itself seriously like the first movie did. But I was proven wrong, and I think it did a really good job of doing that. So to come out and give us another film... Uh, given how the box office did pretty well on it, it, it'll be hard to see if they're going to actually give it a sequel. Uh, But I think if you have this team seeing them move forward into their new, um, uh, seeing their new uh, company that they started to continue storm chasing, I think there's something there for another movie. I just hope that doesn't lose on some of what made this movie so good. So with that, yeah, I'm going to give it five out of five stars. Uh, because it was just it's just a fun time, and there was not one moment moment for me that I felt like there was a downbeat mm-hmm. in this movie. Like everything was there for a reason. I was entertained when I needed to be. I was there were some moments that were shocking, uh, like kind of horrific, um, and I think it was able to encapsulate a lot of different things to kind of ultimately give you the movie theater experience that you do want to see when you go to the movie theaters. Um, and not a lot of movies can justify the reason to go to the theater, and I feel like Twisters did a very good job of doing that. So yeah, 100%, 5 out of 5 stars uh, for me. Can I also just say, I did not know Daisy Edgar Jones was not American. Yeah. She's yeah. British, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and she is chasing tornadoes in an American accent. Yeah. <laughs> like that alone is five stars. Yeah, I think I read yes. somewhere that she actually to do research because obviously they don't get tornadoes in the UK. That she came out and they actually did some form of storm chasing, or it was part of their research and prep for the film to put herself into mm-hmm. the experience. How do I get that job? <laughs> yeah, Leanne, you're already a personality. We're 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 yeah. you're working on it. You're, we'll get you there. You're gonna be the climate scientist need, in Twisters Three. They're not gonna look to Kate. To they're my gonna girl look for Daisy. you. <laughs> yeah, Kate and Kellyanne. There you go. The dream there, team. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> they better be listening. Yeah. Hollywood, come Hold for on. me. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah also even with the director they uh, kind of given the authenticity with the kind of the care that a lot of people brought into this movie uh he wanted to film in oklahoma they were i think prepared in the studio wanted them to film in hollywood and he's like no <laughs> like the first movie was filmed uh, i'm not sure in oklahoma but there was definitely filmed in real world locations we're not gonna we're not gonna get this type of uh, this type of storytelling in Hollywood, you have to bring it to organic. And we also got some nice shots of, of Oklahoma that way as well. It just brought in the authenticity 
for this movie. Yeah, it really showed in, it the, was in the cinematography. Like they get, we get these wide landscapes, and you get the storm off into the distance. I mean, there's some, there's just something so beautiful about it. Like this, this like this massively destructive storm, and like mm-hmm. you're in this clearing area that's sun and shining, but it was just like doom and gloom and like deep and dark contrast with these like really dark black clouds like it's obviously scary and you should look for shelter but it is something like really beautiful to look at yeah absolutely um but you see there you go that's our spoiler review on twisters and somehow we were able to have a longer conversation <laughs> <We did. laughs> it, yes. it is longer yes. yes a longer conversation the second time than we did the first time and if that doesn't say anything about how we can have the same conversation twice and it have had the same enjoyment out of it that i've had this entire two hours oh, yeah. um i don't know i don't know what that speaks to and that all goes to you kellyanne thank you again oh. for taking the time out to just just have this conversation with us and just kind of you know we we love having you on to the show we knew you were the perfect person to come on yeah. for twisters and now you've proved that twice yeah. so oh. <laughs> so i think well if there's a sequel you know who to call so yes. Saying, next time you got Ghostbusters. Pick. Next, hell yeah. Now it's time you got. Next time you want to come on, you just got to pick. You got when you see there's a movie yeah. you want to see, like oh, I'm gonna go see that. You just let us know, and you're on. <laughs> I I will. <laughs> like you guys will see me more often. That 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 gets great. <laughs> We're in the, no, complaints no complaints here. here. I'm pretty it's sure documented. You heard her. I have a guest. I was like, oh, I she have a guest. There's Tim. <laughs> 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 Look at him. <laughs> he is so excited to be here. Hey, hi, Tim. Uh, hey, hi, everybody. Hi. Adorable. Don't mind, don't mind all my stuff on the. She's like, no, no, put, put the camera back. Put the camera back. <laughs> Go away, Tim. Bye, Tim. <laughs> bye, Tim. Bye, Tim. Tim wanted to say hi and bye before we get off. <laughs> Uh, man, this was such a uh, such a very special moment uh, that we were able to have here again. Thank you, Kellyanne, for joining us. If people want to find you, where they can, where can they do that? Ah, uh, gosh, I feel like I'm everywhere. Uh, well, first of all, you could find me on West Two News from 4:30 until 7 in the morning, and then on the CW 18 from 7 in the morning until 10 in the morning. Um, on Twitter, I am Kellyanne WX. Instagram, the same. Uh, Facebook, meteorologist Kellyanne Class. And um, thank you guys for having me. Oh, I am also on. I, I'm on TikTok. I don't post to TikTok, but I'm gonna get there. Okay. So um, if you want to, you know, follow me. Feel free. Well, we'll tag you. We're gonna we'll, <laughs> we're gonna post some clips from the show, and we'll we'll tag you and throw them up there as well. Yeah, tick, Tim tick, better talks. make it. Oh, it will. T- t- <laughs> I believe it. You, you bring that. You bring that energy. So I believe it. <laughs> um, yeah, you are more than welcome to come back anytime to the show. Like you, you are, you are our favorite uh, coming on. It's only been three times. Uh, so I mean, if you count the other one, four. Yeah, you know, technically, technically four. <laughs> you know what? We're gonna technically count four. Four times. Yeah. Four times. The conversation was so good, we had to have it twice. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, why not? And it was longer. Exactly. And it was longer. So you're getting more out of this one. So if that you're one welcome, didn't, everybody. Exactly. If that one didn't go away, we would not have a a, a better version of this conversation now. So it, it kind of it life just be. works out that way. It was meant to be. <laughs> exactly. <Yes>. Exactly. <laughs> um, all right. Again, Kellyanne, thank you very much for for joining us uh, on this conversation. Uh, but we're not going to stop here. We're going to say goodbye to Kellyanne. But we're going to be in a, just a few mere seconds going to be diving in to our spoiler review and kind of a wrap up of our House of Dragon conversation with episodes seven and eight. So if you want to listen to that. Stay tuned right now. It's about to happen. When I start talking, and Russ is going to stop, and we're going to say goodbye to Kellyanne, and then we're going to go to this conversation right, right now. Okay. <laughs> and we're back. Uh, I'd like to thank again Kellyanne for joining us and having a, such a fun conversation about Twisters. I know we, <laughs> we, uh, we had this conversation now a second time, but honestly, I think it was better the second time around. It was uh, unfortunate what happened, but maybe it just worked out the way it was supposed to. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, so with that, we'd like to thank everyone uh, for kind of sticking around as we kind of close out our House of Dragon uh, conversations with Episode 7 and 8. So Ernesto, we'll kick it off to you. Let's dive into Episode 7 of House of Dragon. Episode 7, The Red Sewing, directed by Lon- Lon- Lonnie Peristri, uh, written by David Hancock, 
Um, so this is where Rhaenyra, she confronts Adam of Hall, who's uh, Sea Smoke's new writer, and he just immediately pledges his fealty to her. Um, you know, she's in, she's trying to find what they would call dragon seeds, people of that maybe are bastard born, but they have Targaryen blood in them so that they will deem that they're worthy to, to be riders. Um, we see uh, Laris, he's, he's with Grandmaster Arwell. To, he wants to accelerate Aegon's recovery. Um, while we're in the Eyrie, the Princess Rhaenyra, Reyna, um, she, just, she has the worst um, travel party known in the Seven <laughs> Kingdoms because they just they start taking off down the road. And she's like, eh, they're, like uh, they're like 50 yards away. I'm just going to dip out here to the right. Don't doesn't matter that they're supposed to get me where I need to go. <laughs> it well, doesn't matter that they're mission. in charge. She wants to go she's find the dragon. Mission. She wants to find wants the to... dragon that's in the area. Yes. She wants to find the dragon that's in this area. That's in this area. So they're leading up for us for her to potentially be that dragon seed for this one. So they're looking. Uh, be... I do want to go back a little bit to like Renera and like that interaction with Adam Adam okay. of Hall, mm -hmm. and they they had kind of the interaction where like she was like, "Yo, bro." Like what? Like she's like you have a dragon now, and she was always in the defense mode, real quick. Mm -hmm. That kind of was leading into last episode, and all of a sudden, Adam of Hall was like, "I plead my loyalty to you," and she wasn't really expecting that. And so I think that was a good judge of his character to be like, yeah, "I know this dragon came to me that it was that well, I didn't go seeking for it," um, and kind of just sparked her imagination of like, "All right, well, if this can turn out well for him, where can we go from here?" And it's kind of like spearheading the, what eventually leads into the other end of the episode and then also with um uh, laris like he gets word that there is a new dragon rider and chooses not like the other guy came in with this information like should we tell uh Aemon? and he's like um what did he say he said um perhaps th yeah perhaps one of perhaps this one of those whispers best left to the wind mm. um so that's that's a great line i think there's a lot of great lines uh in this episode that we're going to be talking about later on as we discuss episode seven but i think the dialogue here and the script was really strong for me um in this episode it usually is i mean if anything yeah i mean i've seen clips online now where people are calling back to different moments in game of thrones and just these one-off dialogues like george r. r martin just has a very great way to pull you in and not only understand like the surface level but you get a real sense for the deeper meanings of when these of what these people are talking of what these people are talking about right um we also get queen allison who decides hey i'm just gonna go off to the kingswood and i'm just gonna you know <laughs> me and me and my one knight he's just gonna protect me and we're just gonna go off and we're gonna go off into the woods <laughs> she needed a little me time Ernesto. yeah she just needed to separate uh, she, you know there's yeah. a lot going on it's it's very scary in King's Landing right now. So I... she got hit with a fish last se last she episode. She did. She did get <laughs> she a hit. Said... The fish queen. <laughs> and then she watched. And she's like, honestly, like if you think about it, if I got hit by a fish, you're like you know what? Like a raw, nasty, I... bloody fish like that. Yeah, like not, there was blood on her face. Feeling. No, absolutely not. If so, if I got hit by a bloody fish, I'm like, you know what? Maybe I just need a day. <laughs> to kind of get out of the king's landing let's go find a river nearby i'm gonna just hop into the water and just float there and reflect on my past decisions and where i was and i think ultimately that's kind of what her episode her part of this episode was mm -hmm. for this for, for and that was her that was for no what am i trying to say that was uh her purpose well, yeah her purpose for the episode was her reflecting on like because also like Amond was like, I don't want you to be in the court anymore. She used to have this power as the queen, and then now she doesn't. She's kind of being forced away. She doesn't like how King's Landing's being handled, and now we're gonna trying to see like where she kind of fits into all of this. And she just wants, uh, you know, just get away from it all and just float in the river. I think that was her purpose <laughs> for this episode. La, 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 la. Just float yeah. in the river. <laughs> um, you know, then Masaria tells Renera that she needs to, in order for her to search for dragon seeds, that obviously she should seek out King's Landing to find potential dragon riders because she she makes a mention of how many Targaryen lords she's seen come through the whorehouses there and that, mm -hmm. there's that or she makes she makes a mention of how many bastards she's seen born in that in her time in King's Landing that there's bound to be uh, many more who are with Valerian blood that live in King's Landing. 
Yeah, and I I have like kind of the scene. I I literally wrote it out from the subtitles because I thought this was such a strong scene for me to kind of get that point across that what Masera was trying to say. And she goes in talking to Rhaenyra and was like, you're better because she was looking through scrolls to find more potential bastards mm -hmm. or just more people of the line. And we saw how well that worked out <laughs> for her uh, the previous episode um, when all those people kind of like she tried to go down for that night and that night just kind of burst into flames uh, mm. from that dragon. So it didn't really work out for her that well. So Masira goes, uh, you're better served looking under the sheets and, and in the wood piles. I once worked in a pleasure house where generations of Targar Targaryen princelings had their revels. Uh, there are four score of their Baskers prodigy, at least, uh, that are known to me. There are sure to be more. Rhaenyra then goes on to say, you, sp you speak of the lowborn, but the highborn houses, there is a ancient uh, fealty, uh, there is honor. And then this is, for me, where it really hits mm -hmm. home at what she's trying to say. Masira goes, your royal half-brothers, Aegon and, and Aemon, whose blood is pure, who rage war against you for your throne, you are they bound by honor? Dis. Uh, uh, a common shipwright vows you to serve you while your brother seeks to destroy you facts yeah uh beautifully order... beautifully scripted as well like there's a exactly well, yes well well scripted line uh the the order of things have changed your grace why why not embrace it and then renera just goes on and say all right let us raise an army of bastards and like that's just such a start to finish scene that i feel like was ex executed so perfectly uh in this episode Abs absolutely absolutely so then we go on over to Damon in his haunted mansion. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he is confronted by the new Lord Paramount, Oscar Tully, in which he offers his he gives him his allegiance and but he, you know, he has to denounce he denounces obviously what he did. Then in order for for his for Damon to humble himself, he uh, he has him he has him dole out the justice. For his war atrocities so then he has to execute william blackwood for slaughtering the brackens and i think that that's just so this little kid just played him so oh well what a gangster like he's literally like he tells him like oh you know i'll give you your army like i'm i'm here to yeah. help you and then when they go out into the open and the other northerner lords he basically lays it out he doesn't lie to him he just no. admitted certain parts of his plan and he was able so he was able to appease Damon while at the same time finding peace with the warlords and actually in that moment with the northern with the northern lords but in that moment he was able to gain their respect through this interaction i thought what another well constructed scene throughout the series yeah one of the, the highlights for this season i would say lord oscar is a gangster for, for sure. <laughs> also, like just the way when that when they first started that conversation, Lord Oscar comes in and Damon immediately goes, "My condolences on the passing of your grandsire, but the crown, but the crown congratulates you on your ascension to the head of the house of and Lord Paramount of the, in the Riverlands. Truly glorious, well done." Like just throwaway lines that he was saying just to get in his good grace, and then Oscar immediately just goes, "I did nothing. I I, I did nothing. Did uh, and like." He did like a pretty good toe to toe with him. He's like, Absolutely. "Look, I'm here to help you, like you were saying, but when we go outside, I'm gonna do it my way. And if you want your army, you gotta kill Mr. Blackwood over here." And you can tell he didn't want to do it. And Blackwood's like, "Dude, I'm just going what you what you were saying." But if he wanted his army, he had to create that justice that that Lord Oscar was looking for. And now, also, it's kind of like it was a win win. Mm -hmm. he, Damien got his army. He got the respect of the other houses. And I was like, this kid needs to be in more scenes because that was incredible that that happened. But you can but you can tell when he had to strike him down that like Damon is like he feels the effects of his actions. Yes. Like, like he could tell he's he's bearing the weight of his actions. And then later, mm -hmm. um, you know, we get another vision of a series. And then he asks, you know, we get the scene where he truly asks him if he wants the crown. And he tells him 
you know, so many people have vied for it, and once they have it, it I, for, I don't remember exactly what he says, or if you have it written down, but he I don't he, have he it gives down. it. He gave mention to just like how this crown that people once they obtain this power that it changes them, and they're like you're not the same person who you were that was seeking this crown. That it, it literally changes you, and it burdens the person who wears it. And I just thought mm-hmm. it, I just thought it was so interesting that he's trying to you know his his subconscious or these. Or these or these ghosts in this mansion are telling him like this is not what you this is you're going down the wrong path that you don't this is not what you need to be doing almost subconsciously like letting him know like you're what what need of what needs to be done um, yeah yeah so then we move to jace confronting his mother and talking about you know that the bastard dragon riders that they could challenge the Targaryen's power and threaten the mm-hmm. succession due to his own illegitimate birth. So basically calling out to his mom that he knows that he's a bastard. Yeah. I think that was a powerful scene for him. Yeah. And it, it, it holds all the way to his character because, yeah, I think if I was knowing that I was a bastard, now you're trying to raise an army of bastards. That what, what does that say about me? Like the only, the only claim to legitimacy was I was able to ride a dragon. So if anyone can ride a dragon, then what does that say about me? Exactly. Um, and I think that was just a, an important conversation to have because I feel like it was, in some cases, the elephant in the room that's been kind of going on for years between them two. So the fact they were able to hash it out um, and not really get a resolution, but the things were said out loud. So Yes. So um, the women of Rhaenyra's court, they deliver the dragon seeds to Dragonstone where Hugh and Ulf are among them, which we've been getting different moments throughout, throughout this season. So it's very clear that the setup is for them to take over mm-hmm. as these dragon riders. And we get this scene where it was pretty much like, um, like Renera was like, uh, Effie from hunger games. And I was like, may the odds be ever in your favor. I'm going to go chill <laughs> yeah. back here where it's safe. Cause I already know like 90% of you are going to be, are going to die. And that's literally yeah. what happens. Like yep. they, tr- uh, I think somebody tries. They walk up to it, and then Vermithor just goes crazy and just starts lighting them on fire, eating people. And it's not until Hugh falls down into the dragon pit and literally screams in Vermithor's face, <laughs> "Come on!" Yeah. And Vermithor's like, "Okay, okay, okay. don't right. have to yell. God, I'm right here. Yeah. I'm right here. <laughs> I'm right. Why are you yelling? Yeah, <laughs> I already chose you. Yeah. <laughs> did, did I burn you up? No. No." Ah, I'm you see hungry. the fire in my mouth? It's not out, right? It's in. It's inside. That means I. That means I respect you. <laughs> <laughs> I was hungry. That's yeah. why I burned everybody else. But I was never gonna burn you. I Ooh, felt your alive. presence. <laughs> <laughs> so then we get um, you know, Ulf. He also falls down and he claims Silverwing, and then he takes like Silverwing on this like unofficial flight that flies over King's Landing, and then Aemon sees, and pretty much King Landing's been put on aware that. Queen Rhaenyra has dragon riders and then he yeah. comes and he pursues him on Vagar. They go to Dragonstorm, but then you get this cool, you get like the closing shot of like Rhaenyra on the hill and like her team of dragon riders behind her. Even like on the castle, you see the dragon like, yeah. hanging on the side. It's like, what's up, <laughs> Vagar? What you going to do? You can't, you're yeah. not going to take us all on, huh? <laughs> she, I, th- literally, I just saw that moment. She's like, we got dragons, bitch. Yeah. What are you going to do about that? It was such such a really rewarding moment and kind of the turning of the tide for that character. Yes. And even leading in to what the, the dragon bloodbath that, that that was, like she was explaining and kind of hyping up everybody after. Um, and she was saying that uh, Vertham, Ver, Vertham? Vermithor. Ver- Vermithor, thank you. The largest dragon in the world after Vagar, and perhaps the most fierce. He's called the Bronze Fury. So we're getting like this intense buildup to this scene that ends up just being a massacre of all these people who, to be honest, like they they answered the call. The call was like, if you think you're a bastard, come over to Dragonstone and you might be able to ride a dragon. And they all accepted that call. So really, like they knew at some point they were probably going to die. Mm -hmm. Uh, so like, I think you had to go in there knowing that, and then only the few were going to make it out and it did. So like, I don't feel that bad for them, uh, because that's kind of what you signed up for in a way. Yes. So yes. And I I think that was all good. No, I was just going to say, and I agree. And that's, I mean, and that's how episode comes episode seven, the penultimate episode comes to a conclusion. Yeah. And I honestly, I think it was a great episode all around, especially because like we got such a satisfying conclusion uh to that episode with the dragons and everything really seeing the force that they have Mm -hmm. and seeing all the terror that's around them but also we have the 
the the Hugh and and Ulf storyline that was kind of kind of there in my opinion randomly, mm -hmm. and then we kind of see the real purpose that they had. The same for for Adam of Hull. Like yeah, there's other things that were going on with his character, but he really wanted to get that validation that he was a somebody after being a bastard from Corliss. And we do get the interaction at the beginning of the episode with Corliss where he just kind of walks in there and kind of did not really speaking about the how he is the bastard of his son, but they kind of both know and he just says, well done, and then just walks out. He's mm -hmm. um, like, and that was about it. So like, yeah, I feel like all these like, these little stories that have been building throughout this season, we were able to kind of all this come together in like this badass way where, where at the end, she has dragon riders he just has the one and then we see how that continues into the next episode absolutely so then we move to the finale episode eight the queen whoever was directed by Gita Vasant patel written by sarah hess so it opens we get um tylan lannister he's a lot he's allies with the triarchy and he's uh he's he's been set to wrestle with ad with the admiral uh shark carl lohar in mud, mud wrestling which was a really funny opening scene because, it was because they, it's like they bury they bury all the leads in the setups like first you hear like oh well you have to meet this admiral and then like upon the admiral comes then you see the admiral says like well I, you know that it's a woman and then and then it goes into them having to mud wrestle and the whole mud wrestling scene back back and forth was hilarious he wins he impresses her they're eating dinner and then you should tell she's giving him the look and she's like, I like you. You're handsome. Yeah. He's like, oh, you know, thinking that you, that they want to hook up. And she's like, I want you to fuck my wife. It's like, oh, yeah. oh well, there, there, oh. hold on. There's a lot to unpack with everything you just said. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So are we on it? Are we on the same team now? Yeah. But first you gotta, you know, you gotta get, get, get on that. Um, what was also funny, because even the behind the scenes that played after the episode uh, was over, they were talking about the scene, the mud wrestling stuff, and they were saying that how, like, as we, there's a lot of seriousness that comes into this episode, like, in this, the season, a lot of drama, not a lot of levity that comes into it, and I feel like this was, like, the first time we get to, like, actually laugh a little bit when it comes to half House of Dragons, seeing them kind of must wrestle, seeing the, the Admiral's kind of charisma that they have, and it's like, okay, so, like, this is, like, a character that I hope we can see further explore in season three. Absolutely. Um, which, which we, I think given how the episode ends, it's very clear. Like that's what the yeah. step is to, for these characters to come in, to come in as series regulars in, into the fold, or at least for, mm -hmm. the, at least for the beginning of the season. Uh, yeah. So then we move to Laris where he has this interaction with Aegon and says, listen, renera has got dragons. Your brother's really mad. He just, burnt this town to the ground like <laughs> yeah. um like we need to get out of here he tells him we should go to bravos because that's where heron hall's gold is stashed with then when they come back we can claim the throne after after all the fighting has subsided which i thought mm -hmm. was really interesting with him mentioning the golden bravos because it almost was an admission that he burned heron hall down which is what killed um uh it's his brother Ceres's right his father Renera's boo that, that that's right that's right but i think it was his uncle or something like that that's um, right it was some some sort of family member that, that also perished yeah because they they mentioned that the, it was burned down but it was never i don't i think we knew as an audience that he burned it down or i i don't remember it because it was in just because it was in season one um but yeah. either but still he admits to Aegon base basically that he was involved in 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 what happened um, yeah so I thought that was great, you know, kind of pretty pretty much saying, "Hey, we're leaving you guys. This is you're gonna go away for a while." Um, then we go to Reyna. She finds the wild dragon. We don't really we see that she sees the wild dragon. She doesn't fully interact with it yet. Um, then we come up on our boy, Kristen Cole, sitting on the log, <laughs> and he's like sniffing on Allison's. Uh, a little hanky, a little hanky, little he, napkin, just yeah. a little napkin that he because he just misses her so much, and you yeah. know, not even considering that her her brother's there. It's like, hey, what the fuck? Like, that's my sister, <laughs> bitch. Like, <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> he, he's like, I knew it, and then he takes a sword to him, and then he comes to like this depressing line, uh, and he goes, "To die will be kind of a relief," and he's like, "God, man, what a what a ruined the mood yeah, a little bit," and then he just. Yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> what's wrong with you? 
but but he but he makes a good case because he's like jaded by dragon war because he's seen yeah. he's thinking you know that this sword i was gonna be the justice bringer like all everyone this is all i ever wanted to do for the realm and this and that and like once you after the battle of rook's rest like it literally changed his perspective on life he's like we're we're like it really ant, did we're ants to these to these monsters in the sky like like they're fighting and we are we are the fallout for that because they're gonna land on you their blood will literally boil you and that's if they're not burning you with their dragon fire so like who care you gonna kill me just end it now that's fine like yeah like he's just yeah, he's just a sad man now honestly after that battle we really didn't really get to see much of christian cole's character kind of leading into that so this is in a way kind of capping off the season with that line that he says he's pretty much in a down moment right now not really knowing what to do um hmm. uh, moving forward as this war is brewing happen is you know brewing with with the two factions yeah so then we we move over to Amon who he's resting on the this mountain and we're looking at what's called this town called Sharp Point. Um, he just decimated this town with Vagar. And it just really shows like what a just a vindictive person he is. Yeah. Like he didn't care. Like he's supposed to be the queen the king no excuse me, the prince regent, like the protector of the realm. And he's literally burning towns to the ground. So, yeah, just because he's like, oh my god, they have more dragons than I do. I gotta, I gotta show my worth. That like his ego is yes. insane right now. Yes, it's ridiculous. Even so much so that what happens later on, where he's trying to force his sister mm. to go, go on the dragon, and then Allison was like, "What the hell are you doing? Like, yeah. know your place, sir." Yeah, she's the she's the only pure one. Um, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so then we move on to Rain Ren- Ren- You know, she's was hoping to have more dragon riders so that we can deter conflict. But you know, in the end, she decides that she's sitting at this small table um, with her dragon riders and um, her son, and just kind of like her her dragon rider council. And then you know, we get mm-hmm. these interactions with Hugh and Alf, and Alf is like just not somebody who's knows proper proper etiquette and of how to act in front of a queen and like he's kind of an asshole yeah and him and jace like really are there's like this weird tension between them that i that like you could feel like it's gonna bubble up to something because we keep like just right now off in this one episode we just go there in this immediate like tit for tat back and forth in the in the uh, couple of scenes that we got that we got with them yeah and it's kind of crazy with all because he was such like this kind of like uh he had a big ego in the tavern and then when you know when it came to like in, when he's face to face with the dragons he was very insecure about himself and wasn't sure and then all of a sudden he's like oh i am a dragon rider and he's just wearing that confidence and his ego yeah. boost is just significantly up but he has no respect for how he got here uh why he got here he's like oh now i'm just a badass now i'm just gonna put my feet up sit on the queen's chair um ask for more birds during dinner uh and like just being really disrespectful about it whereas adam and 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 hugh were more like more respectable like i it's a privilege to be here i'm happy to be here and he's like i deserve to be here bitch um and has no regard for for anything and so I wonder if that's going to be part of his character where he's just going to stay an asshole or if he's going to learn how to be humble uh, in the episodes to come in season three. Yes. Um, so then we move to Corliss and Alan. They're on they're on the shore and mm. they're, getting, they're getting ready to ship out. And we get this really great scene between the two of them where, you know, Corliss is like trying to after uh, Rainus' death, he's trying to like build this relationship with the sons that he has. And Alan calls him out on his bullshit. He's like, you you know, you were never there for me before, but now all of a sudden that all your kids are dead and your wife is dead, like now all of a sudden, and because I'm the first mate and because your other son is now a dragon rider, you feel thus to have our worth. And then he tells him about this instance where he literally sees him in the market for them to pick out, he's with his other family, trying to pick out like treats or just something from the market, something luxurious because he makes it a point to tell them, he goes, I remember us trying to fight for scraps and I'm literally watching my father pass me in the market and um, trying to find desserts for his family. Like where, mm-hmm. like, what about us? Like we, we didn't matter then. So why should we matter now? I, I thought it was a, just a great, 
back and forth between them. Really, Allen, just his his, his exposition, because yeah. Corliss did a lot of listening and not a lot of talking. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you. It was it's it was a really powerful scene and kind of a good way, a good character moment for him, where he was always the quiet brother out of the two for the majority of the season. He's like, nope, I'm just not gonna, I'm just gonna leave it alone. This is where I'm meant to be. I don't want any accolades. I'm just gonna be me and just move on. I just want to be the, on the ship and all that stuff. And we really see him kind of get at some backbone mm -hmm. um, in a way and kind of like, you know what, Corliss, fuck you. I don't need you. <laughs> Um, and that was, I, I, that was a, a really well orchestrated scene, but kind of building up to this moment throughout the entire season. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so then, Renera and Adam fly to Heron Hall after Simon Strong sends warnings to Damon that they may be treacherous because Damon he he, oh, he meets in the in the in some kind of in the courtyard with one of the northern lords and you see simon strong kind of just creeping in the background <laughs> so then, you know, also the memes for simon strong have been hilarious i don't know if you've been seeing them uh -huh, but they're yeah. like they're saying like the entire budget of house of dragon is just going to this guy's outfits and yeah. it's <laughs> so good <laughs> i mean literally it is funny you say that because it's funny when renera comes into the hall and that when they see that the queen is there and he yeah. she's interacts with damon you can see simon strong like clapping in the background like oh yeah. blessed be <laughs> she is here our queen <laughs> uh but, be but before renera comes here we uh damon has a vision from a alice rivers Yes, um, Alice, you know, meets him in the middle of the night where he goes, literally, do you ever sleep, witch? <laughs> um, and then she leads him down to the Weirwood tree where he foresees a future, including the White Walker and Daenerys Tar Targaryen, which is really interesting because we're looking at, you know, Game of Thrones footage. And like yeah. we're looking at the Game of Thrones timeline and that far into the future and that how even now that these whatever events are happening in this moment will based off Damon's decisions will affect what is going to happen in that future. And I think yeah. I and I think I read online that they didn't use stock footage. They actually hired a young actress because there's a moment where you get Daenerys sitting in the fire with the eggs. Yeah, with the dragons, yeah. But it's not but it's not anything from Game of Thrones. It's something the extra that they have shot in addition to that and they didn't use Amelia Clark. They used another actress. So I thought it was oh, really okay. I thought it was I just think that's interesting. So I wonder if we're going to see any more flash forwards in the following two seasons mm -hmm. yeah and yeah and then we also saw um helena in there as well kind of giving damon some warning uh as well yes in the vision yes but he but all these visions are in, are in telling him that he needs to swear fealty to rhaenyra who's just arrived which, which and then eventually he ends up bending the knee Yes. Uh, to her, and then that shows everybody else that you know Damon's been on the side of Rhaenyra, and because we weren't sure this entire season if he was building up his own army against her to be king himself, or if he was building us all this army for Rhaenyra, and then we find out that it was for Rhaenyra based off these visions. And I don't know. Part of me, this is me being cynical and just wanting more drama into the show. I think drama-wise, it would have been a lot better if he just wanted to be king, and like he had his own agenda. And I don't know where this story is going to make that call right now, but I think right now it would, for me, it would have been more interesting if he didn't plead his loyalty to Renera. And we just, because then I feel like that. So, so basically this whole season was him trying to figure out whether he wants to be King or not or, or whatever. And then these visions were giving him clues, but then he was finally ready to see the future. And then that's what made him want to go with Renera. I just feel like it was a little bit of a letdown of how we got here. I, I could see that, but I, I think that they made a case for it only in the fact that we spent all season of him like denouncing this witch and then through these little actions of her um, sending the poison and like mm -hmm. her being like with him in his visions and how strong these visions have been for him. Like he had no choice but to accept it based off everything that has happened in his time in Heron Hall. Yeah, I, and I'm not saying that there's not justification there. I just feel like we just that was probably one of my least favorite parts of this whole season was mm -hmm. every time we cut to Damon him chasing ghosts, and I just feel like the end result was like, okay, so you're just gonna go back to an era where like we didn't even have to do any of this. Like you could have just been with her the entire time, like been lo like loyal to her the entire time and building the army for her. We didn't need to have these visions and like to contemplate whether or not you want to be king or not. But I understand that's part of his character. But what? I don't know. Part of me just felt like it was a little bit of a letdown. 
I can see that. Unless it, they're setting us up for what's going to happen. Unless that's going to come back to us in the next two seasons. Maybe. Yeah, because honestly, it doesn't. To me, it doesn't look like it. Like, I think we've already spent enough time on this. Let's just focus on the war that we did not get at the end of this episode, which I wasn't expecting. But, like, anyway, we'll get oh, to that yeah, a little we bit later. Make it, we'll get to that a little bit. Yeah, later. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so then we, as you mentioned before, Eamon meets uh, Helena on uh, on uh, on some rooftop of King's Landing, which, yeah. and I think, I don't know if you and I talked about this, but I literally thought that he was going to throw her overboard. I yeah. <laughs> Like, the whole time he was there, I was like, man, he looks like he's... Like, he's just so mad and just the way he was approaching her. Like, I thought, yeah. like, her saying no would have sent him to to throw her over, to throw her overboard. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, she he asked her to demand, that he demands that she flies Dreamfire in a battle. She refuses him. And then she tells him that Eamon will die in the war. And it's, it's almost sensing mm -hmm. and it's connected to Damon's vision that, I think, given her experience and watching her baby's head cut off, that maybe she is now being able. She has like the third eye raven sight. Yeah. Like how Bron has. Yeah, and it was kind of a badass moment for yeah. her as a character as well. And and she just basically tells, uh, 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 Aemon was like, Aegon will be kin again. He's yet to see victory. He sits on the on a wooden throne, and you you'll be dead. You'll be swallowed up in the god's eye, and you'll never be seen again. I was like, damn. Well, and that I, that's. And I think just... the God's Eye is a call to something specific. I believe it's the lake. It is the lake. Yeah, I watched a breakdown video and they were describing it as a lake. Yeah. Um, but I thought that was just a badass moment for her and kind of just like telling her brother to be like, "Hey, fuck off! You're gonna die anyway, so none of this matters for you. Yes. I'm gonna be fine. Aegon's gonna be fine, but for you, you know, whatever you're doing, you're gonna die. So I don't really care about you anymore." So I think we then we um, rise to pretty much what I what I would assume is this is the assumed the pinnacle of this season, where mm -hmm. Alicent secretly travels to Dragonstone, offering to she's going to surrender King's Landing to Rhaenyra for her family's safety, but she says and only for that to happen is that Aegon's going to have to die to ensure the transition, which she makes a point because who's to say like after we take over like we're not just right back where we're not right back where we were and i and it's yeah. and i think that they have a great moment back and forth just kind of like reflect on everything that's happened and how we're going to get here to this point and she even tells her she's like history will look at you as a villain yeah just a well yeah and beautiful, uh, a beautiful just a beautifully delivered line it, it, i mean i'm just a just a beautiful scene i, I was uh in the breakdown video that I was watching, they said that this scene, this interaction was never in the book. Mm -hmm. um, so this was all for the show. And it was kind of just like the pinnacle, the peak of what this season is. We see in the poster here that these are the two people that are, we've been kind of following our main characters throughout the season, as well as the whole show, but primarily the season, um, kind of them going back, you know, head to head. And we see that tense conversation they had earlier in the episode where Renera realized that Allison screwed up and misunderstood what Venera uh, <laughs> was saying. Um, and so now we get to this realization where Allison comes in and breaks into Dragonstone again. <laughs> um, and, or not again, but like she breaks in or maybe she was allowed in. I don't know. Um, and then Renera's like, what the fuck are you doing here? And she's like, and then kind of admitting, he's like, look, I'm wrong and I'm tired of this bullshit. And like I have like the the power doesn't mean anything. I just want to take my daughter. I want to get the fuck out of there. So I got a plan for you, whether you believe me or not. Um, and, you know, you can go in there. Just you know, everyone's gonna be gone. Just go sit on the throne, and everything's gonna be okay. And if I was Renee, I was like, no, I, I don't believe that one bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have Renee kind of telling her, he's like, no, I have to kill your son. Uh, that this is this is the only way that can happen. And she was kind of against it at first, obviously, but then she was like, yeah. All right, that's what you got to do. And then I believe they said the line, a son for a son, again, yeah. which was, yeah, again, which technically it, it did happen in a way uh, earlier on this season. But this was what the true meaning was yes. for a son for a son. And I thought that was a crazy callback from that. And you can tell that even Renair was tearing up when Allison was like, yeah, I guess that's what you have to do. And then they both kind of just leave <laughs> the scene that way. It was, it was very, very powerful character moments for sure. Absolutely. And then, uh, and then we see Otto in a cage, and then it's kind of like we're hearing the wrap-up music. We hear, you know, everybody's yeah. kind of like, or like literally, I'm sitting in my chair, and I'm like, oh, this, this kind of feels like the end of the episode. Like, <laughs> like, 
I feel like something and 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 then you're basically just setting us up that Westeros is about to prepare for this massive this massive war that's about to happen. But I feel like yeah. we were deserved another big character moment to end the season on. Cuz this final episode yeah. literally felt like a like a 70 minute trailer for the next season. Yeah, no kidding. Um, I, to say that I was a little bit, it was kind of anticlimactic yes. the way that it ended. Yes. And it, it just felt like that we, we honestly, we spent this whole season building up to the war. We knew it was coming. And yet we just spent eight episodes to continue to build upon this war. I'm not saying that these scenes didn't need to, you know, still needed to happen. But like last season, we had 10 episodes. This season, we have eight. I would like to believe that if we had two more episodes after this, this would have given us at least the start of the war that we might have been looking for. Um, and it's so weird because literally the last episode, I felt so fulfilled because we got those big, big moments mm -hmm. in there character wise and a spectacle with the dragon blood fire, like all that stuff. I don't, that's, that's a cool name. Blood fire. Maybe blood that's fire? dragon name soon. Is it blood no, it's not blood fire, but I just made it up. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just said the dragon. I meant to say bloodshed, but I said blood fire. And I was like, that sounds, really this is cool. blood fire. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, but yeah, we had like that, that dragon massacre with everybody. And that, that was such like a spectacle to see oh, Rooks, Rooks. on the screen yeah and like honestly that would have been a cool moment to end the season on it's like yo bitch i got dragons and i was like okay war is about to start but instead we get a different ending and i feel like it was kind of short changed the audience a little bit and i know i'm not the only one to feel that way because i saw it online that like bro where's our war like you we were not to say we we're a promised one we're gonna get one but like and we're gonna wait till season three In two and years. it kind of almost felt the way Two, and two years. No, yeah, for real. Um, and it was kind of a way that we talked about this uh, maybe a few weeks ago that we were talking about The Walking Dead. Um, and we, we were talking about the moment that we kind of fell off where the Negan, where we know who's Negan going to kill. And instead of showing that at the end of the season, they waited for that moment to happen in the beginning of the season, with beginning of the next season, and kind of shortchanged the audience because we were building up to this moment. It's like, ah, now you have to wait just a little bit longer. And I feel like this kind of was the same case for me where like we were building up to this war, at least we we're going to see a little bit of it. I wasn't expecting all of it, but at least the start of it. Uh, but yet we kind of just get the preparation for it. Um, and in the, in the behind the scenes, uh, in the behind the scenes um, video that played at the end of the episode, it was one of the creators and he was kind of describing everything that was going on. He said that uh, the Lannisterns are arriving in the Riverlands. The high towers are marching through the reach. The winter wolves are coming from the north the uh triarchies are sailing uh we see the sea snake now called the queen that never was mm -hmm. or that ever was uh that corliss decided to change the name to um is going back to sea damon has his army in the riverlands allison's fourth son is on a dragon the blue queen is flying in support of the massive high tower army we see we find otto in this cell somewhere and we don't know where he quite is or what actually happened to him. We see Renero discovers a dragon, but we don't know what happens after that. We see Laris and Aegon basically escaping King's Landing. Um, and it's just a reminder of all these things that have been put in motion, which they put a, which they can't pull back from. And I think that's, I agree with that statement. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, we do see all these things coming together that no matter how much you don't want war to happen, it's already started. So war is going to happen. Absolutely. I just don't want to wait two years for that. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it, like for me, Overall, I think I really enjoyed the entire season, and it's been a fun mm -hmm. ride. But it was it was really a letdown for a season finale. Like I, I yeah. felt like we were earned, we were owed another, we were owed another moment. But really, it's and it's like, I don't know, like especially since I've read the book, this is not like I really feel, like I was for certain that we were gonna end at at a big moment because it would have been a great mm -hmm. season ender. Um, moment but it seems like they're going to be saving this moment that moment for next season but i just don't if we're got two more seasons i mean they got a lot of ground to cover but it, i'm also curious yeah. where where in the book they're going to end as a, if that makes any sense like where yeah because the book kind of extends a little bit past it's almost like they almost like wrap up the whole dance of the dragons it's like a little bit of a wrap up and you end you, you well, I don't want to give it away, but you, but okay. you, you end in a point that's 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 a little bit after this time. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, I do think it's 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 interesting that they decided to because season three was 
House of Dragon was renewed for season three before the episode before the season started. Um, season two started, and then literally immediately afterward, the co-creator was like, um, "We're getting we're getting a fourth and final season as well." So it's nice to know that as we're building toward this show, we have an ending in sight. Yes. Um, we know we're ending with four, so we know that the next two seasons are going to, you know, culminate together. Um, like we can build upon the story appropriately, and I think four is also a good number too. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't mind four uh, as a yeah, solid, a solid run, especially since when you think about it, we might even get the start of season four for another four years from now. True. So they have a lot of ground to cover. And you said you read the book. So I think it's an interesting point because right now I know we're leading to a war and I don't really know what, what comes after that war. Cause I know the whole time we were just building toward one. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to see what happens after the war that warrants another season, like two more seasons worth of story. Um, but I will say, that at least some of the good stuff that came out of the, the final moments of the episode was the cinematography Absolutely. because it looked gorgeous as we see everyone kind of prepping for war. And there's one shot in particular where we see Renera like on the bottom of the frame and we have like those, like those diamond shaped like shelves or whatever they're called. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of taking over the whole scene and we just see the Renera in like one part of that little diamond shape. And I was like, wow, that is a beautiful shot like, okay, that they are able to yeah i was like damn look at you guys then we see also allison just like on the mountaintops and like you see like this like the the landscape it's like it looks gorgeous i was like all right i feel a little short change but some of these shots are pretty incredible and then also the music is going like uh -huh. <laughs> and i was like okay all right let's go and then it's like well now you gotta wait i was like come on suck um yeah and even the creators are going on saying while this season was very much about the fits and starts of an early an early medieval war season three is clearly going to be about total war mm -hmm. and i hope they deliver on that yeah i mean there's a lot of crazy shit that's gonna happen <laughs> yeah uh well i'm i'm glad that we still have a lot more interesting things to come so Absolutely. maybe season three is gonna be more of like all the action that season two was kind of building up on but kind of going off what you're saying I, this was a new experience for me because I never really watched the Game of Thrones House of Dragon week to week. So I think it was fun to just have these conversations uh, week to week. And I think, you know, I think we were having a good time having these conversations week to week as well. Uh, kind of just ingesting on to the content as well as expressing it between you and I and just uh, a different way of kind of enjoying uh, the show. Yeah. And, I, and I, I actually really enjoyed this and we did it. We also did it. Um... A little bit with, with the boys, uh, more so with the boys, very, very, little, very lightly with uh, the bear. But I, I, That's yeah, right. I, for, I see us doing this again, you know, given the right content that we can commit to yeah. week to week. Um, this is definitely something I, I would love to revisit again. And, and obviously when season three comes out, we'll we'll have that conversation, too. Um, but, yeah, mm -hmm. this is fun. It was overall overall. The season was great. I was just yeah. I was just a little let down by the, the finale. Yeah, I agree. I'm in the same boat. Like I thought overall, I think it was a good season. And it gave us that, that really great dragon battle in episode four. Mm -hmm. So I thought, honestly, I think the stronger episodes with episode four and episode seven were probably the two stronger ones for me. Mm -hmm. I agree. And just a little bit of a letdown. Uh, so hopefully we can make up for that in season three, at least to start of season three. But looks like we're going to be waiting a little bit longer. So yeah. Uh, that's all right. Uh, but there you go. We gave you a full ass show here sure did. Uh, between a full conversation uh, with Kellyanne about Twisters as well as our wrap up on our House of Dragon talk. And and then hopefully, you know, in the next couple of episodes, we might be able to find a new show that we can continue doing these kind of weekly reviews. If not, just have a, a, this a. Uh, and if anything, just a longer conversation about a show we've both watched, um, if, even if we put in our watch or watching. Um, but yeah, uh, if you want more from us, actually, no, before we do that, uh, Ernesto, tell our listeners what they can look forward to next week. Ooh, next week. I think this is a movie that you and I have both kind of been anticipating. Like the, the yeah. trailers have really, that I've been forced to watch just from going to the theaters, um, <laughs> have been really captivating. Uh, it's M. Night Shyamalan's Trap with Josh Harnett leading the movie. Um, one of the taglines, 30,000 fans, 300 cops, one serial killer, no escape. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious. I'm curious to see this movie. I'm excited. I just, you know, I don't, I don't want to be let down with the M. Night Shyamalan experience because his movies are very, yeah. his movies are very hit or miss for me. Um, so I'm hoping that this one is a hit. Yeah. And, and I, I agree with you. M. Night Shyamalan is a hit or miss, but I don't know. This one has 
has has my most intrigue in quite some time when it comes to an M. Night Shyamalan Absolutely. film. I was like, oh, okay, this one actually looks like it has some legs to stand on, and it could offer an interesting twist, uh, to like which he t- famously does with all of his movies. So uh, I'm looking forward to have this conversation because uh, hopefully we can be, you know, we can this could be a good one. Absolutely. And if not, we'll, we'll let you know if it's bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you want more from us, you can always follow us on our social media channels on Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok at Box Office Bingers, our X and Letterbox page at Box Office Binger, and our Instagram and thread page at Box Office underscore Bingers. We want to thank everyone just for listening to us just talk about movies and TV shows, as well as Kellyanne for coming back onto the show. Uh, she was a real savior for this episode. <laughs> and uh, we, we literally, this episode would not be anything without her coming back, and it's very much appreciated. Of, of that and uh, yeah it's, it's just a very special moment for her to come back and do that so I'm very very grateful and thankful for that uh, but also thank you for our listeners for just coming back and listening to us to talk about movies and TV shows each and every week we really do appreciate it come back next week for more movie fun you're not going to regret it and for that I've been your host Matt Diaz I've been Ernesto Santos see ya